I'm happy to be here, Gordon, because this is another exciting Wednesday. And today we have got a really, really, really cool and serious and successful entrepreneur. And I'm happy that Michael's here on the show. But before we get started, for everybody that's listening to the live show, we're happy that you're here. Our audience all around the world is growing week by week by week. And we are very grateful. We are very thankful for everybody joining the calls or watching the recording adding uh, contributions uh, to it and sharing insights. And we're happy to, to have these kinds of guests. We are really grateful for that. Uh, and before we get started, um, so a couple of weeks ago, just seven weeks ago, uh, Gordon and myself, we took the initiative to pay something back to the crypto and blockchain industry. And this is how the initiative, the project Crypto Wednesday was launched. So every week we are here, same time, same place. So for some people, it's a little bit early for oh, some <laughs> Painful, my friend. <laughs> it's it's painful. I'm sorry for that, Gordon. So you 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 can share wherever you are. I got to move to Europe. Go, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so in in Europe we are at 2:30 p.m. So in the afternoon that's really cool cool time. But we got people from all over the world. So before we get started, if you're uh, joining the live conversation, if you're joining the live stream, if you got some really cool questions for our guest, and this week that's that's Michael, please drop it in the in the chat box. So our moderator, my friends, uh, look can take care of the questions. And we also, well, uh, most likely have some special guests coming into the conversation today. Some of the previous speakers or maybe some of the future speakers that are joining today's uh, main guest. Uh, and before I forget, I also want to appreciate and show my uh, appreciation to Iconic Digital Asset Management from Amsterdam, the number one crypto fund for powering and making this uh, Crypto Wednesday every week uh, available, so we're really grateful on that. And for, before I hand over to my friend Gordon, for all the people that don't know me, I have to introduce myself. My name is Sander de Bruin. I'm from Amsterdam, the capital city in the Netherlands. I've been involved in the crypto and blockchain scene now for quite a couple of years, and I'm happy to launch this great Crypto Wednesday show together with my friend Gordon Einstein. Uh, and I, I'm curious, Gordon, in, in today's, uh, today's show, where are you? Are you still in LA or are you a different place in the world? I'm in Los Angeles right now. Um, like last time, it's going to start being dark outside the windows, you know, behind me. By the end of the show, probably like last time, I'll be I'll be covered in this angelic morning glow because literally it's 5:30 in the morning here, and I'm you know I'm in a suit, I'm showered, I'm everything else, just for you and everyone else here <laughs> and a special guest I'll mention in in, in, a, in a moment. So I'm very happy to be doing this show with you. I can't believe we're up to episode eight already, and yes, this thing this thing is steamrolling. Um, especially the, you know, the, the long tail views is, is neat, but I'm, I'm happy to see we got some familiar faces in the audience. We got Marco, we got Luke, Maria, good morning. Good to see you. Virtually, Peter, I'm, I'm happy you joined us. We, you know, we got sort of the Swedish connection here. Um, and we got what, what I like to affectionately refer to as alumni speakers joining in, including David Johnston, who Michael Turpin knows well, and they have good anecdotes to share. Of course, we're going to do start at the beginning of the show. And I, I let his name slip. Uh, we're going to start at the beginning of a show with our very special guest, uh, Mr. Michael Turpin. Michael was kind enough to give us his time. He, he's very busy. He's, he's you know, I, I, I can't really call him an original gangster because he's still a gangster. He, you know, it, like he never stopped doing it. <laughs> time is precious. So I, my, my new affection term for him is the dean. Because, you know, <laughs> he's, he's, still, he's, still, he's still, you know, teaching, he's still schooling us on what needs to get done and also going out there and doing it. So, um, Michael, good morning. I, I really appreciate, you know, despite your, your sunny virtual background, I know you're, I think, in Las Vegas on Pacific time. So I, I, I am, and this is uh, good morning. So uh, uh, I'm also kind of uh, cast in the dark shades. I tried to uh, uh, tweak the, um, uh, the lighting in my room to make it looks somewhat uh, sunlighty, but uh, it's dark here. And uh, mm -hmm. like you, I will be bathed in the sunlight. I'm, I'm in my office in Las Vegas. Um, I spent uh, most of the year in Puerto Rico, um, primarily, uh, but I, I, not, not hurricane season. Hurricane season, um, I'm, uh, I'm in Las Vegas. Um, this is my actual backyard. Um, it just, uh, it looked like that in a couple of hours. Right now, it is dark. Wow. Yeah, I know the feeling. So I, I think I said, I think I heard Sander slightly mocking us for this time zone. And he's like, yeah, it's 2.30 in Amsterdam. <laughs> like, yeah, thank, thanks, Sander. Really appreciate that. That's great. 
Uh, Michael, before we do anything else, show us your mug. Oh, sure. This is, um, let's see, this is a Bitcoin mug. Um, I actually got this from, uh, oh, let's see, the virtual backgrounds don't, there we go. No, there you go. There so you that, go. Perfect. That, 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 that's the Bitcoin uh, coffee mug. Um, try to make sure I whip it out any day that Bitcoin is up uh, um, substantially. It's actually up a little bit today. And um, uh, I uh, purchased this. Uh, I think David and some other folks have, have one. Uh, I purchased it from uh, Bruce Fenton's uh, son, uh, AC, who uh, um, has a, a company that he started when he was about eight called Bitmugs. And so oh, okay. you can go, you can go and get them online. I forget if it's AC Bitmugs or Bitmugs.com, but uh, they're great mugs. And uh, he's a uh, budding entrepreneur in, in his, you know, single digit years. He might be 10 by now. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. He's 10 or he's. Oh, he was eight when I bought it from him. He might be 10 or 11 now. It's Bruce Stutton's son. <sighs> You know, which of course always brings up the question for me, what the hell have I done with my life? I mean, this guy's eight and he's <laughs> five, so that's nuts. Um, well, it helps, when you, it helps when you have Bruce Fenton as, you know, former uh, executive director of the Bitcoin Foundation and founder of the Satoshi Roundtable as a father, so. Mm -hmm. Yes, choosing your parents wisely is key. So, <laughs> you know, I, 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 next time I'll, I'll, I'll get on that. So actually, you know, that, that's, that's kind of a good, hey, Mayor, good morning. Um, so that, that's actually a, a good segue. You know, we, we, as usual, we did a pre-interview. Um, Michael, you're very generous with your time. I think that was creeping up on three hours. I, you know, I think, I think other people would. It was, it was a Sunday afternoon. I didn't, I didn't have, uh, you know, anything really pressing, so I didn't be like, gotta go. And so I was enjoying the conversation and, you know, rolling a couple of, uh, of uh, concepts past you since uh, we go way back in terms of uh, um, talking about different legal constructs. And so I wanted yeah. to explain a few things to you in detail that I was sure. working on. Yeah, it was great. You know, in six pages of notes, that's, that's, <laughs> Congratulations, you just broke the record. So I, I just want to lay some context for the group who are getting to know you now. Let's, you obviously have a deep background and we'll go into it, but just top level now. I think most, most people know you in association, and I want you to broaden this because maybe the, maybe the understanding sure. is narrow and it needs to go broader. They kind of associate you with Transform Group Public Relations, but you're, obviously, but you're really so many things, but you're the transform group, which is a broader category of thing. Can you kind of say what, what's your main, who are you now? What are you doing now? Yes, me, sure. <laughs> so, um, you know, I changed the name of uh, Transform Public Relations to Transform Group in 2015 hmm. um, when I started doing other things. I mean, in 2013, David Johnson and I uh, started uh, Bit Angels. Um, and uh, that sort of begat uh, the Coin Agenda series um, because I wanted to have a place where investors could actually get together in kind of a Goldman Sachs-like, uh, you know, conference environment and not the typical crypto show where you line up for the food truck between sessions because I wanted to be able to get, um, you know, upscale accredited investors who were curious about uh, Bitcoin and blockchain and crypto and um, didn't want to have to sit through a lot of panels on, scaling and libertarian issues to get to the one or two panels on investing and coin agenda since it's you know dawn in 2014 it's our seventh year um you know uh has always been about uh, all the different topics in investing uh, both from the entrepreneurship category of the company how to attract, attract investment investment and uh, also from the um, investor side you know are you wanting to invest in companies and in tokens um, in DeFi now and all the different things that, uh, that come up that are uh, things to consider as, a, as an investor. And uh, so that's, that's now the investor events division of Transform mm -hmm. Group. Um, you know, uh, when, when, when David, uh, you know, moved on to do more things with the fund world, um, I kind of took over uh, Bit Angels because I wanted to expand it into physical events. We're now in 15 cities, all of which, of course, are shuttered. Uh, David's still a very active participant in uh, in some of the chat groups and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I've had him as a uh, featured uh, uh, fireside chat at Coin Agenda, and uh, have have to have to get him to uh, speak at the Austin chapter. Although he's spending a lot of time in Europe these days. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, so so uh, Erica Zapanta, who's been with me since 2014, and 
has uh, been instrumental in every one of the Coin Agenda shows. I recently promoted to Global Director of Events um, mm -hmm. for Transform uh, Investor Events. And uh, so she runs both uh, the Bit Angels chapters as well as the Coin Agenda conferences, which are um, monthly now virtually. Um, we're doing one on Asia the last Wednesday of this month. Uh, just go to coinagenda.com and bitangels.network for full schedules. Everything's virtual right now. We are still hopeful that we can do a at least partially physical event in Las Vegas at the end of October. Um, if Money 2020 can bring 6,000 people to town, and they're still saying they will, we can certainly get 150 people um, to come to, um, um, you know, actually we'll probably hold it uh, uh, right here, um, which we've held several parties of more than a, 250 people so we can uh, structure it for, uh, you know, they have part of the, uh, the venue for, um, for actual, you know, people to sit and watch uh, live speakers and then go in the, uh, you know, kind of back area and uh, have a screen up if you want to just be outside the whole time. Now, so that's, what do you think here? Is this Mike Tyson's house? Ex house? Yes, yes. I, I did buy the Mike Tyson mansion uh, from the Hangover uh, fame where he keeps the Tigers where he used to keep the tigers that's actually next door this one is actually a much more livable house this was his entourage house mm. so he actually bought wow. two homes in the in the 90s when he got out of jail and uh, had 150 million dollars sitting in his uh, bank account from the upcoming uh hollyfield fights and uh you know bought um you know two uh, homes sorry this is pre the yeah year. yeah yeah before he bit the ear so uh, okay <laughs> at, at, any, at any rate, there's a lot of cool stuff between both properties, but uh, this is uh, this is the more livable place. It's on one level. Uh, it's wrapped around with a pool, whereas the um, the you know famed Mike Tyson mansion next door um, is like the Adams family house. I mean, it's like over multiple stories and got mm -hmm. all sorts of crazy stuff. And uh, you know, we're gonna probably spend quite a while renovating that and then you know use it for larger events and. Um, Eventually, you know, sell it to some sports celebrity who's got too much money and make it make a profit out of it. My wife is a real estate uh, investor and developer. And Maxine, your wife has been key to a lot of the work you've done together. She is. She's definitely she's definitely the uh, you know kind of my secret weapon. I mean, um, travels all around the world with me and makes sure that uh, you know everything gets done properly in the backdrop and uh, you know. But what's to stay in the background? Yeah. So okay. Sorry. <laughs> I, I did say her name. So I, the so yeah. So the other the other the other divisions besides trans, transform uh, investor mm -hmm. events, um, we still have transform public relations. Uh, that's our largest group in terms of uh, employees. Um, and uh, Xenia von Vedel has been running it for me. Uh, mm -hmm. Literally, Xenia has been with me with, for twenty years across three of my agencies. So she's a a, a real uh, you know trusted uh, leader on the team. And, um, you know, she's chief operating officer. And, um, you know, once I get a lead uh, for, for and make a deal to do public relations for, for a company, um, I'll sit in the first couple of strategy sessions that I turn it over to her and the rest of the team and just pop up when somebody, you know, needs me for strategic guidance. I've, you know, long past the point in my career where I'm spending my day getting on the phone to the Wall Street Journal that got other people to do that. So, um, you know, it's one of those things that because I've been so known as the first, you know, person to start a PR firm in the space and my, my prior career involved, you know, both starting a newswire, market wire, as well as um, having a well-known firm in the 90s, the Turpin Group that, uh, that I sold that, uh, you know, launched a lot of the iconic internet brands, Motley Fool, Earthlink, America Online Greenhouse, Match.com, um, you know, I... Uh, it's hard to just say I'm too busy to do public relations anymore because I, I do enjoy taking and finding early stage companies and getting them well known. Um, but I would say right now I probably spend maybe 20% of my time on that. The other 80%, um, I'm, I'm really spending a lot of time on advisory work. So I think we're at a point in the industry very similar to uh, 2015 where there's some just really good, you know, um, diamonds in the rough out there and oftentimes i find them because i get approached or recommended for for the pr side we'll end up doing that too but i i, I help them with their business models if they're mm -hmm. a token i help them with their token economics um i i'm you know i'm a business model wonk 
And I think that uh, we're just at the beginning um, of what you can do with tokenization and blockchain and cryptocurrency as the rapid growth of DeFi this year has shown. Who mm -hmm. knew that like a year ago, we were gonna have $9 billion with rising with a bullet in these uh, you know, um, very interesting and diverse models um, for you know, generating a yield, yield farming and, and generating very high interest rates compared to what you get from your traditional bank. I mean, we've normally said that cryptocurrencies, you know, first killer app is like payments and, um, you know, uh, and you have certain advantages over, uh, over legacy banking systems and speed, but boy, the advantage on, uh, on the ability to earn a return uh, in terms of yield um, is really a much more dramatic uh, number. So, so that's the public relations side. Um, uh, the advisory side is something called Transform Strategies. So um, I started that formally uh, a couple of years back when Enzo Villani, um, who was the um, uh, former managing director of strategy at NASDAQ, who I worked with when I started uh, MarketWire, which was originally called Internet Wire. We got it funded by Sequoia Capital. We then partnered with NASDAQ. They invested in us. And um, he was sort of like the guy who was running the corporate uh, services division and, you know, getting all the NASDAQ sales reps to uh, sell market wire, which is very instrumental to our growth. We sold that company um, in 2006. Uh, and then I, I, I started a company called Social Radius, which is one of the early social media marketing give me, firms. Give me, give me pause, pause for a second. because there, there's I want to kind of frame this for the audience. One thing that came across loud and clear during the pre-interview is your, your approach to things that I'm going to try to encapsulate and then I hand it back to you, which is, I'm impressed by your kind of like Brock from the last interview. You're, you're, you're a hacker in the positive sense, which is you look at a situation that you're unfamiliar with. You learn a lot about it. Unlike maybe some other people, but I think Brock does this too. You work with experts so you can get the expert perspective. Mm -hmm. you're, you're methodical, you're cautious, but then you take unexpected, unorthodox action. And you, your career, when I follow the trajectory of it, and how it got from, you know, from your Wolverine-like origin story to the present. <laughs> you know, just like, you know, he's like the eternal soldier who fought through a million battles, like the everyman soldier, and then he kind of shows up at the end, like the superhero. You, you kind of like, are that for me? So, I mean, you, you started off with, you know, two, two uh, I guess, two majors in college and then a master of fine arts. And then, you know, can you... Can you? Yeah, sure. So I, 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 I grew up, I grew up in the upstate New York. I grew up in Buffalo um, and uh, just, you know, working class environment, neighborhood. Uh, my dad was an artist, uh, actually still is. He turns 97 in a couple of weeks wow. and um, still, still paints. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, in Buffalo, you couldn't really make a living uh, sort of as a fine artist. So he designed wallpaper for a wallpaper factory and uh, then did silk screening for, for many, many years until he retired, you know, gosh, mm -hmm. almost 30 years ago. Um, and you can say that when you're 97. Uh, and, um, you know, he still has some great art. You can follow him with Walter Turpin on Facebook and mm -hmm. all that. But um, at any rate, I uh, always knew I wanted to be a writer. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with that. I, um, in first grade, they asked everybody in first grade to go and write a story. And most kids came back with a paragraph. I came back with five typewritten pages. Wow. And, um, you know, they showed it all around the school and said, what the hell is with this kid? And so I kind of knew from there that writing was sort of my talent, like my dad's was art. And uh, I had two brothers who were very good at music. And, um, and so that's really where I've kind of funneled my creativity. And the great thing about writing is it really makes you think mm -hmm. and be concise in your thought processes. And so... Um, I went to school at, uh, at to university at uh, Syracuse, um, which uh, then and now has one of the top two or three, depending on the rankings. Um, I'm on the board, so I should say the top in the world, uh, journalism schools, New York School of Communications. And um, got, you know, I, I got two masters, or sorry, I got two bachelor's degrees at Syracuse in three years. So that was wow. sort of my first hacking of the system because um, I got a, you know, fellowship uh, or a scholarship rather um, that paid, you know, full pop for everything the first two years, half of it for the third year, and then you're on your own for the fourth year. That was kind of common in those days because they figured by then you're on the hook. So I figured out how to go in, 
And instead of like working a summer job, I, I transferred uh, credits in from a state school in Buffalo that was cheaper um, into Syracuse and got two degrees in three years and saved, you know, two thirds of my tuition and also got an extra year in my career that way. Um, I did the same thing with my master's degree. I ended up, um, after graduating, um, I got my first job as a newspaper reporter. I was the Potsdam, New York bureau chief for the Watertown Daily Times, um, a, a paper that had a unique distinction of having more subscribers than population. Watertown had 50,000 people and the paper had 70,000 readers because it covered the entire Don't top like third of the state. <laughs> I'm sorry? It's almost like the upcoming presidential election. There'll be more voters than, there'll be more votes than voters. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> if you believe Trump. Um, at any rate, um, <clears throat> so um, now because it covered the entire top third of the state, including mm. the very sparsely populated Adirondack, Adirondack Mountains area. And so, um, I, I, I did that for uh, for like a year and a half and, you know, chased fire trucks and, you know, uh, realized that uh, the glamour of, uh, of being a newspaper reporter in a small town is uh, not all that glamorous nor all that uh, uh, good compensation. And uh, that I honestly did not even discover public relations until after I was out of school, despite, you know, having gone to a college that had one of the top public relations um, um, programs. I, I, I took the journalism program. I didn't take a single PR course. Now mm -hmm. I go back and teach PR courses. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, I, I covered on my beat in that, in that uh, small town. Um, there were several universities, including Clarkson University um, and, um, and St. Lawrence University. And Clarkson mm -hmm. University, which is a very tech-oriented school, and both my brothers are computer programmers, well, one time IT, artificial intelligence lab, um, and so I've always had interest in technology, uh, and Clarkson was looking for a PR director, and it paid considerably more than um, what my newspaper job did, and so I was encouraged by the person who was outgoing to apply for it, and I did, and I got it, and that's really where I started my PR career, just being a university uh, you know, PR manager, um, and, you know, then went back to get my master's degree, uh, got it in uh, two semesters, because Again, hacking the system, uh, I was able to go in and um, take night courses for free because the university offered free courses of anywhere in central New York as part of uh, the, you know, uh, kind of a perk of uh, being an administrator. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to create, you know, just like I got my four-year degree, two of them in three years, I was able to get a two-year degree in, in nine months. So again, saving precious time. And I then had to make a decision on whether to go and, you know, be an academic because, you know, uh, my, 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 even though I wrote nonfiction and fiction and, and poetry, poetry was really what I was best known for. Um, mm -hmm. I've won some awards. I, I was a, 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 a fellow at the Squaw Valley. I was um, uh, won an Amer Academy of American Poets Award. Um, and, but I realized that, you know, a bestseller in poetry is 5,000 copies, mainly to universities and mm -hmm. libraries. And you just can't make a living that way unless you get on the road and become a performance artist and or become a college professor. And, um, and I would have needed to go back and get a PhD in English to do that. Because even though they call a master of fine arts a terminal degree, you still can't get a job unless you've got a bestseller. And if you get a bestseller, you don't even need the, the degree. So I uh, was offered the Great Chair Fellowship, which is very prestigious to basically just hang out in Buffalo and invite famous poets from all over the world and, you know, work directly with uh, uh, my friend, the, uh, the, the late uh, Robert Creeley, who was wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. But I, at the same time, I got a job to move to California and run PR for the University of Redlands and decided that was a better career track and never looked back from there. Maybe better weather also. Yes, I definitely, after 25 years of increasingly bad weather, growing up in Buffalo, what do I do? I go to Syracuse for school, oh. worse weather. Now, what do I do after Syracuse? I get my first job in Potsdam, New York, where, you know, for much of the winter, it's 20 to 30 below. So yes, um, I applied to jobs only in California and Florida. Interesting. And, and re regarding your hacker approach, one thing you mentioned is your, I guess your father, who you clearly love and respect and was, very, you know, is a very hardworking guy. He was in a union and I guess they were on strike at the moment you wanted to go to school. 
So the that, need that's correct. So he was telling me I can't help you get into a fancy school like Syracuse. So I said, you just help me by uh, by being out of work because I now qualify for more, you know, kind of uh, poverty assistance because, you know, uh, when you're making sort of just, you know, working class wages, it's one thing when you're completely without income. You know, I, I fell into like a higher category of need. And mm. um, so I was able to, you know, afford to uh, go to Syracuse, which has been a wonderful um, experience for me. I mean, I really got to study with world class uh, professors and uh, and they really, you know, combined, I think, to a degree I haven't seen in a lot of other universities. Um, the um, academic as well as the practical. I mean, literally for my magazine writing course, your final mm -hmm. assignment was write a story and sell it. Mm -hmm. You could not get an A unless you sold it. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote a profile of Jonathan Tisdall, who was the 13 year old um, uh, uh, chess champion. He had just won the US Open at mm -hmm. age of 13. And he was a friend of mine because I was Syracuse University chess champ. And mm -hmm. so I knew the local chess player community and Jonathan was a, you know, savant. And so I, I did a profile of him and I sold it to the uh, Syracuse New Times for, I don't know, maybe $10 or something, but it was a sale and it got into, uh, you know, the kind of local alternative weekly magazine as a feature. Yeah, hey, money's money and it's a different world. The moment <laughs> you get even paid anything, it's a different psychological and conceptual world then the throwing well I actually I actually sold my first uh, magazine article when I was 11 right yeah I, I amazing end of oh, you know there's so many, there's so many notes so like I'm, I'm kind of you need to bounce around a little bit here this is what, what I thought was interesting that you mentioned before is this sort of your the way you blend your hacker approach and you, you kind of point out you know necessity is the mother of invention so you know yeah. it, it drives you and but you you're not necessarily a move fast and break things guy. And it, I, I, I think that maybe relates to your chess mind, which is. Yeah, I, I'd say, uh, yeah, we, we chatted about that a little bit in the pre-interview, so I'll pick up on that. Um, uh, you know, there's a saying that um, you can tell the pioneers, they're the ones that, with the arrows in their back. I mean, you much, you, 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 you would have wanted to have been um, VHS in the 80s instead of Betamax, right? So being first um, always doesn't win. In fact, uh, there's a, ancient Greek saying, or it's a Greek saying, I had a Greek friend that told me about, told me this saying, which I liked. It's called the second mouse gets the cheese. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously the first one's in the trap. And so I, I, I've got the blessing and the curse of coming up with ideas really early. Um, and in the past I might rush to them and, you know, make a lot of mistakes and maybe run out of money. I mean, I did that actually, one of my uh, first entrepreneurial uh, efforts in the 90s while I was running my PR firm and started becoming what I call to this day a parallel serial entrepreneur. So mm -hmm. um, serial entrepreneurs start one thing, finish it, take a little time off, start another one. I have so many ideas uh, and there's so little you know, time in, 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 in a given life that uh, I usually, I've always had the greatest respect for uh, Bill Gross with Idea Lab, right? Mm -hmm. he, he sold one company and then laid out on the beach in Hawaii and said, I've got too many ideas about how to do great businesses on the internet. I want to do them all. So, and so he started Idea Lab and just threw his ideas out and found entrepreneurs to run them. And that became a phenomenally successful mm -hmm. uh, incubator. Um, so, you know, I've, I've known Bill for years. We, we, we get along. We, we we're overdue for another lunch, but, uh, you know, we just like, when we, when we, talk about things and um you know so that that's like an icon uh that i, I try to follow in, and uh in, in his example of how to structure things obviously you know steve jobs and elon musk have been able to create simultaneous giant companies at the same time that's that's sort of taking it to another level i think uh i don't think i have the management uh chops to be able to and discipline to be able to do spacex and tesla and you know and, and um Solar City at the same time, but uh, but you know the incubating of things that you then hand off to other people to run, um, mm -hmm. you know that that I can do. And so in the '90s, I had two spinoffs of my agency while running my agency. And again, then too, I I found really good people. I had three offices in New York, San Francisco, and Los Angeles, and great people running them. And they just basically you know kind of ran their shops, and I came in as needed. And then I kind of peeled my time away to. Uh, 
incubate what became, you know, internet wire, then market wire. And that was a big success. But uh, before that, I had one that uh, I raised some money for and we were too early. It was called direct IPO. Mm -hmm. Direct IPO was uh, launched April 1st, uh, sorry, April 2nd. I didn't want to make it like April Fool's Day, April 2nd of 1996, the same day that um, Wit Capital launched. And so we were kind of the Coke and Pepsi of the early um, equity crowdfunding space. This is before blue sky laws. And so we raised money and ended up spending it all on lawyers who told us, no, you can't do that. That'll be $50,000, please. We went through all of our money that we had and went out of business. And my partner in that was a stockbroker. And so he's the one who approached me with the idea of using the internet to do direct offerings for natural food companies, which was a passion of his, because those are the ones who really incubated direct offerings. Um, Wit Capital was named after Wit Beer, and they would put an 800 number on the beer bottle. And I, get, I used to joke, you'd be drunk when you'd be reading the prospectus. And uh, you'd buy stock and you'd get like, you know, kind of an affinity offering in it. And, you know, he, I don't know if you could say he was second because we launched the same day, but uh, he took it slowly and he was actually a security lawyer himself. So everything that I was told by our big, you know, East Coast law firm we couldn't do, he did. And the SEC said, wait a second, can you do that? Huddle, 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 no action letter. And so he ended up selling Wit Capital to E-Trade for, I believe it was about 300 million, which they oh, probably shut it down as competition, but I'll take 300 million to be shut down. Um, you know, we, we raised maybe 300,000 and spent it all on lawyers. And so that is, um, obviously we've had probably as many legal talks over the years as anything else. Um, right. That is sort of why I, I decided never again to sort of like let lawyers run my business. You find out what the law is, you talk to as many of them as possible, and then you make the business decision. And that certainly yeah. followed me into what I do in crypto. No, but we, we have, hi Eugene, we got a, and hi Wolf, we got a, and hello, wow, we got a good people joining here. Um, you know, I, I like that. It, it, it's kind of, I have a parallel philosophy, which is you never just talk to one vendor, you never just get one bid. You know, mm -hmm. you need you need bad now. You need best alternative negotiated agreement, and even with your service providers, there's there's no substitute for doing you know doing your own research to a certain extent. Like don't try to don't try to replicate them. Otherwise, what's the point? And life is too short. But you've got to get it from multiple sources because the truth is usually in kind of the gray middle, and then then you have a route to pursue it. And it, you know, it, it's, I think it's part of your methodical entrepreneurial approach, which is you know, and we'll, we'll talk about where you, not yet, but we'll talk about, you know, your structuring and regulatory perspectives for 2020. And just as a preview for the crowd, it has something to do with a triangle in the Caribbean. And well, yeah. I'll, let you, I'll explain that. But, you know, one thing you said to me is you, you're working with a very good attorney in that soon to be named country, but you're, and you're cautious, you don't do anything illegal, but you're, you're not handing the initiative to them. And you're not giving them a veto, it sounds like. Is, is that a fair characterization? Well, when we get to that, I mean, I was, I, I was looking for, for the last several years, uh, you know, after the initial, you know, SEC uh, guidance came out about uh, the Dow having been a security, which it clearly was, and yeah. then sort of the, um, you know, uh, regulation by enforcement approach that the SEC has taken and, you know, tanking a, a number of really viable projects that I don't believe violated the Howey test of are you a security or not. But they would go after them and say, you know, we think you are and it's going to cost you millions to defend or you can just admit that you're, you know, that you're wrong and, and or, or, you know, no contest and uh, we'll declare victory. And, you know, a lot of people didn't have, they went after, I literally heard somebody who worked for the SEC in enforcement um, mm -hmm. at the time say, our job is to go and club baby seals to death. They go after people who can't defend themselves, which I thought was horrifying. And, and um, part of why the U.S. is in trouble. Like we, well, like yeah, and, and you know, I mean, a, an example of the harm that it does. Everybody's like, "Oh, protect the investor, protect the investor." Um, I think there's already sufficient uh, investor protections. And if you look at the proposal that uh, Crypto Mom and Hester Purse has made, I think that provides all of the you know no bad actors, and you you can't do you know a whole swath of things, including any kind of fraud or misrepresentations, mm -hmm. but. She has a three-year safe harbor where, you know, you sell your tokens and you've got three years to build a community 
Um, because how can you say that you're sufficiently decentralized or that you are um, useful if you have no users and you're not allowed to go and sell those tokens into the marketplace? I mean, what has happened, of course, um, in lieu of that has been two things. Um, one has been people simply just going back to venture capital and saying, okay, great, I'll build my blockchain with, with you know, Sandhill Road money. And the problem is that when they then get to the point of their road, uh, of their, um, uh, of their roadmap that says, okay, now we're going to build uh, a token, they go, oh, let's talk to Wilson Sonsini. And they say, no, 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 the token's bad. Uh, just, just go and do it in the cloud. And so they lose control of their destiny um, because it was an awful lot of FUD, particularly in Silicon Valley in New York, um, that uh, everything was a security because we read the Jobs Act instead of, you know, really interpreting the Howey Act um, in, in, you know, I think uh, a parsed manner that uh, shows that everything is not a security because, uh, because you thought it was. Um, so, and so I think right now the, the, the best, the best, the best way that most companies, I think, if you're starting without venture capital um, is to just simply take, you know, angel money. It doesn't take millions of dollars to build your first prototype, build it with that. And then, you know, if you've got, um, uh, if you still want to do, and, and the ICO is dead in the sense that um, it makes no sense these days to just open up an ERC 20 address to the world and say, Hey, come on in. We don't care who you are. We're not doing KYC. That's, that's a roadmap for disaster. And then the IEO was like supposed to be a solution. And then you had a whole bunch of scammy exchanges um, really take advantage of it and, you know, keep most of the money and then crush the tokens. And so I think right now the preferred way that you're seeing the kind of renaissance of uh, the altcoin market, uh, the ones that are new are basically just raising money privately and maybe taking one or two large funds as investors in an offshore offering and then listing. Now, I think that's, that's 2020s. Let's distinguish between listing and issuing, because I, I actually, I, when, I needed you to repeat that for me the last time. So you, sure. Can you distinguish for us? So, so issu issuing is when you basically go in and you do an offering where you're selling on the exchange, your tokens. Listing is when you've already distributed uh, tokens, either as airdrops to your equity investors and or in an offshore offering um, to some larger funds. So there's already stuff out there. You're not selling yours into the market as an initial offering. And so you then, you know, secure a listing agreement with, you know, any of the fine global exchanges out there. I typically recommend that uh, if you're in America, um, you know, the rest of the world can do anything they want for the most part. I mean, relatively mm -hmm. speaking, but um, that if you're in America, you start with a, you know, foreign exchange, a Singapore exchange, perhaps, um, that, uh, that still allows, uh, you know, us, uh, um, residents mm -hmm. so that you're, it's their issue as to whether you qualify or not. And they all pretty much are, you know, they want you to get an opinion letter from a lawyer that you're not a security. They, you need to see all your due diligence. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I mean, that's probably one of the main things you're asked for these days that, because the market's president. opening up a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And just, so uh, I'm gonna go back to the midpoint of your origin story. Cause I think it leads into this. You you know, you did, you started your PR company or companies, but th then you had a specific engagement with Fujitsu, which I think kind of oriented you towards tech. Well, that was, at the, that was at the very beginning. I mean, so I, um, you know, my first PR assignments were working for two universities and then I started my own, uh, company, um, you know, in the late eighties, uh, called avatar communications. That was just basically me. And, um, you know, and I hadn't quite figured out what, you know, areas I wanted to represent. We, you know, represented some sports things and a little bit of early technology. And then I ended up uh, joining uh, a place called Canyon Studios Advertising. And I basically was their PR wing. And it was great because they had an instant, you know, business space that they would sign them up for ads. They say, you want some PR? Great. Here, you know, meet our, and, and that was a joint venture. It was like, I basically just, you know, bolted onto them and I was, it was still, you know, my company, but it was, you know, licensing their name sort of. And so we just had like a, you know, they just marked, marked up my services and I started building, you know, um, a little division. And then the two founders there, one was an artist, one was a businessman. 
had a big disagreement and they, they broke up and, you know, kind of, I wouldn't say they disbanded the place, but when the businessman left, um, all of a sudden there was no new leads. And right. the, the, the artist was basically staying up all nights playing music and, uh, you know, he brought in a new, a new, a new uh, art director. And I think one day when I came in and just, you know, you know, they were all just partying and everything. I was just like, this is not how you build a business. And so I decided to put my own shingle up in, you know, early 1990 uh, with no clients and, um, um, you know, and, 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 and a 300 square foot office. And my first client was Fujitsu, which happened because um, the person who had left joined Fujitsu and said, hey, we need to launch a new division. You know, can you handle it? And I was like, yeah, sure. And, you know, that sort of launched me on the scene. We, we did a great job for them, got them. USA Today, big story, and uh, um, you know, Business Week, and just all sorts of things. And so, um, yeah, that that was back when I was excited to get on the front page of USA Today because that was the main thing I did. Since then, I obviously got more interested in just sort of like working with entrepreneurs and um, and starting new businesses. But uh, you know, I still know how to do that stuff, and you know, it's something I'm never going to lose that skill set. But, but I, I think also that was your first large foray, quick, you know, doing PR for tech, then you started, you know, uh, market wire, and then you then kind of leading to the social radius and the social media. So I think that- Yeah, that yeah. so I, 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 I ran um, the Turpin group for 10 years, started mm -hmm. out with just me. By the time I sold it, we were a uh, top 25 uh, um, high tech uh, PR firm in the United States. And I sold it because I thought market wire at the time, internet wire was a bigger opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, I also, you know, sold it in, in you know, um, early 2000. So that was kind of top of the market. And so I got a good price for it. And, um, and then, um, you know, then I, then I just concentrated on the, on the internet wire, which became market wire when we did our deal with NASDAQ and we sold that in 2006. Um, and um, at that point, you know, I, I, I had a nice enough uh, wire transfer come in that I, you know, bought a big house. I moved to Vegas earlier just to save on the taxes mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, was trying to figure out what's my next uh, act. Am I going to do a platform or am mm -hmm. I going to do services? And I looked at the opportunities and I had a couple of really good ideas for platforms, but I didn't want to be that, you know, kind of pioneer with the arrows in the back. And um, I was, you know, pitched a few people on some of the ideas and they told me all the reasons why they couldn't work. And so I thought, you know, I don't need permission or venture funding to start an agency again. And mm -hmm. so I started Social Radius because social media marketing, viral marketing was starting to take off. I'd been dabbling in it for a while. And, um, you know, MySpace marketing, LinkedIn marketing, this even before Facebook, mm -hmm. um, really took off. And um, so Social Radius was born. and. Um, kind of grew that pretty fast and then uh, got a bunch of big companies as clients like, you know, Philips and Marriott. And uh, then 2013 happened and I discovered, um, you know, uh, the opportunity in, 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 in Bitcoin and blockchain and just completely the magic internet you know, money. Hit, hit, yeah, the magic internet yeah. money. And, and I was ticked off that I hadn't found out of it before because I had a couple of uh, near misses. I mean, in, in April of 2012, uh, we had a client, the Future of Money Conference, and I used to always go there as part of, you know, uh, working uh, their PR and getting media to write about them. And I had a conflict, so I had to choose between that and I think, I don't know, ad tech or NAB or something. And uh, I made the wrong choice because had I gone there, I would have had the same reaction when Bitcoin was $4 that I did a year later when it was 120 And, you know, the year that you got in with, you know, diving in with the all, all hands and feet, uh, yeah. you know, gave you far more opportunities. Um, you know, the people who got in in 2017 didn't do as well on average as the people who got in 2013 who didn't do as well as the people who got in 2011. Yeah, that, that, that always gives, that gives me a twinge, but, you know, that's kind of like the, so, but you, you discovered magic internet money for real in 2013. You know, you had some interaction with Brock about this. Can you talk about the well, Brock, Brock, and, Brock and I go Brock and I go way back. So Brock, um, I've known since he was about 21. Um, mm -hmm. I did 
PR work for several of his gaming companies. And um, he had an office in Santa Monica at the time that was uh, half a block from mine. And so, you know, we had a symbiotic, uh, you know, relationship business-wise and also friendship. And, um, you know, he one day, you know, ran down to my office and said, dropping all the gaming stuff, all in on Bitcoin. And, you know, he then explained to me this company he was going to launch and he had five or six ideas in mind. Um, and the first one was GoCoin. And so uh, GoCoin, which originally I think was going to be called Currency, um, mm -hmm. we brainstormed the ideas of how to launch it and the name on my conference table at the, at, you know, what was still then called Social Radius. Um, and, um, you know, and uh, he asked me to go and, you know, kind of launch it with all the media that were coming to the first real, you know, Bitcoin conference, the first Bitcoin foundation um, mm -hmm. conference in San Jose in uh, May of 2013. And that was a seminal moment in the industry because prior to that, the largest conference had been 70 people. And that was in New York in 2011. So to go from 70 people and no media to go to, you know, CNN and Reuters coming to cover this crazy internet thing in uh, Silicon Valley was a huge thing. And so mm -hmm. literally, you know, uh, many people can just go point back and say, oh, I met you, you know, in, in San Jose. I mean, you know, that's where a lot of relationships were just really cemented. And so that's where I met David Johnston. And um, we met um, the, uh, the middle night of the conference um, at the cocktail party on the rooftop and immediately started like, you know, finishing each other's sentences like we'd been married for 30 years. And I could see that he was oh, incredibly, you know, bright and, uh, and uh, forward thinking and entrepreneurial and, um, you know, and a man of action. I mean, uh, I asked him, you know, I saw these VCs um, writing checks. I mean, Coinbase announced the $5 million A round. Brian was there handing out t-shirts in front of a 10 by 10 booth. I'll show you how long ago this was, another $12 billion market cap or something. Um, and, uh, you know, Kraken had a 10 by 10 booth. I mean, all these BitPay had a 10 by 10 booth, little tiny booths in the back of the convention center. It was really literally the dawn of the industry. And um, I said, I don't see an angel group. Most industries have angel groups. And uh, are there angels in this space? He said, yeah, they kind of, you know, you know, just sort of like know each other and, you know, meet, meet, you know, meet online or whatever, or just email each other, and, you know, get in Skype chats or whatever. And I said, um, you know, so there's no angel group. And he goes, no, why don't we start one? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the man of action. And so I came up with the name Bit Angels. Uh, David literally took out his phone and registered uh, the domain bitangels.co because .com was already taken by by uh, Kraken, by Jesse Powell. <laughs> Still will not sell it to me, but that's fine. We're now bitangels.network. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we decided to, you know, put a, uh, uh, an organizing meeting the next hey, day at the- uh, Real quick, just, you know, David Johnson is now joining us. Not not to speak yet, but he's he's watching oh. you. So you. Okay. Well, you told me he was on in the, in the waiting room, so shout out yeah. to David. Um, no, I mean, literally, uh, you know, the decision to start Bit Angels together was, I think, uh, a huge um, a driver in sort of a lot of the things that happened in, in 2013 and 14. I mean, MasterCoin, the first ICO, I mean, David was the lead investor. He was the chairman. Almost all of the $600,000 in token sales that happened um, you know, was uh, from Bit Angels. Um, I did the PR. You know, it was just, and then, and then, you know, David just, you know, kind of, um, you know, came up with the idea of, of the Bit Angels Fund One, which we raised six million dollars in Bitcoin. Uh, you know, later renamed the DApps Fund because it was all DApps, which you know David came up with that term. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, invested in MadeSafe, invested in 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 in, in Ethereum. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, pretty good track record about, you know, uh, success during 2014 going into the right daps. And, you know, mm -hmm. David basically traveled all over the way. He went to Scotland to, you know, really uh, do due diligence on, uh, on MadeSafe. So it was a very exciting time in 2014. <laughs> no, you know, I mean, I mean, they were, they were like these, you know, techie guys in, in Scotland that, uh, you know, is again, finding the, the diamonds in the rough and, uh, 
you know, I remember when um, their token sale happened, it was the first multi-million dollar token sale. They were looking to raise $8 million, which is like way more than anybody had raised before. And um, it was a whole month that they had to raise it. And it was all raised in five hours. Yeah, and it was just yeah. stunning, right? You know, and so that was a, that was, a, and I remember we had a time, because, you know, I was doing PR for MadeSafe too. Um, we had a time so that we would, we would do the sale um, right after I got them a keynote at uh, Inside Bitcoins. And, you know, th that was sort of how you launched things back then. You know, you get a keynote, like Vitalik had a keynote to read his white paper at uh, the first Bitcoin Miami show. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like I said, the 2014, 15 were, um, just, you know, the old days, right? I mean, they were just, those are the true OG days. And uh, that's where you learned a lot of lessons. And then you also realized, you know, when things changed, how to pivot, because it wasn't going to stay that way forever. And, um, you know, when Bitcoin went up to 1200 and then went back down to 150, um, you know, everybody's like, Bitcoin's dead, Bitcoin's dead. And this is like, no, it's a cycle. You know, um, I remember, um, you know, Brock started something with Matt Rozak called the, uh, Bitcoin Supper Club, which then later rebranded as the Blockchain Supper Club. And you'd get a sponsor to get like the top people in the industry together to have drinks and dinners. And, you know, the, I mean, I probably went to like 30 of them over the years and they were just, you know, everything from just like really informative to like just, you know, wild times with, you know, lots of alcohol and food and, and, and you know, bonding of, of the top people in the industry that happened there. But I remember um, in, in Miami, of 2015, was that when the bottom was? Yeah, 20, 2015. Um, you ended up having, you know, it, the, the, the price went below $200. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we had all these amazing people and we held it at the Versace mansion in Miami. Cool. And uh, I, I took a picture of like the top. Uh, it was after, it was, it was you know, it was, it was when it was privately held and I think it's now in, in, in other new hands, but. Uh, yeah. Uh, we had probably about 40 people, you know, out by the, by the pool, which, uh, you know, nobody's permitted, permitted in the pool. And yet, uh, you know, Mo Levin and another person jumped in the pool and got banned for life from it. So, but I, I took a picture of all the people there and I put it on my Facebook page and I said, if this is Bitcoin's last supper, let it be at the Versace mansion. And yet, you know, later that year, Augur, you know, did the first ERC 20, uh, uh, offering and that was just months after everybody said well the the token sale is dead forever and you know 18 billion dollars later between yeah. auger and probably you know mid 2018 mm -hmm. um obviously that was proven wrong and now everybody says the token sale is dead forever and it's just reinventing itself that's yeah, evolving so and for the entrepreneurs or budding entrepreneurs in the group you said something before that really resonated, which is you had been kind of like standard PR, and I, I know you're much more than PR, but it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a phase shift I want to point out. You've been sort of standard PR before you went to this conference. Lightning struck and you were aware of internet world and what how, how that person had grown um, their conference. You decided to do something different this time in terms of getting to know people. Can you talk about that? You sure. So um, when I first discovered the, the internet in the early 90s, um, I went to the very first internet world and, you know, I kind of had previously understood how important it was going to be. But then when I saw all these little 10 by 10 booths of like Lycos and you know, people went out to be huge, I, you know, really, you know, sort of dove into the internet and, you know, got to meet all the companies, but I was getting to meet the companies with the idea of, you know, signing them up for, for, for PR. Um, and every now and then I'd invest in them too, particularly if they, you know, had bigger ideas than they had checkbooks and, I invest in about 30 companies and, you know, I had a 50 X on one and a five X on a few others. So I more than paid for the ones that, you know, went under or just became mm -hmm. lifestyle businesses. And so, so that, that was the investment model that I continued uh, to this day um, to have, you know, part of the, the, the formula. But one thing that I didn't do was I didn't really try to get to know the, the C-suite, right? The, the, the people who are the founders. I mean, I got to know some of them because I started out really early. I mean, Sky Dayton was really, you know, it was him and like, you know, one part-time person when he started Earthlink. And, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, sitting there writing his, you know, his, his press conference speech with him, 
you know, mm -hmm. when we announced the, the deal with Netscape that they would have, uh, you know, a exclusive agreement to distribute Netscape um, on Earthling for like a couple months. And, you know, we got a USA Today story on that and that sort of launched Earthlink, but I didn't really sort of make a point of like really spending a lot more time with the entrepreneurs. And, you know, once, you know, as happens, you know, you cycle and they grow and they hire a different firm and then a different firm and different firm. I didn't stay in touch with the entrepreneurs themselves. Uh, Pam Alexander, who was a competitor and started about 10 years earlier than me, um, you know, she sold her, her firm for like, you know, 60 million. Uh, yeah. which was a multiple over what I sold my firm for. And the reason was because she, you know, got herself on the board of Ted, got herself on the board of all these things where, you know, all of her relationships weren't with the marketing directors, they were the CEOs and the founders. And so that was something that when I got into the um, Bitcoin blockchain business, I decided, you know, let's not just hang out with the marketers. Let's uh, really, you know, get to know the entrepreneurs and see how they think and, you know, that's when I also really just started kicking my, you know, business model mind in and really kind of helped, uh, you know, advise companies as well. Yeah, so, you, you know, you you learned from prior experience. You evolved and adapted it. I, I thought that was great. And and also that sort of, in my mind, that the moment you kind of broke out of your initial channel and became much more of an advisor, much more of a thinker, well, and, 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 and what happened was, you know, in, um, in 2015, I decided to reposition uh, Transform um, from being um, a PR firm that happens to be, you know, um, big in blockchain to a blockchain firm that happens to be big in PR. And I literally told my, um, you know, uh, non-blockchain companies that, you know, um, I'm not going to deal with you anymore. If you, you have a certain budget, you can deal with my staff. Otherwise, if you're not able to kind of meet our minimums, you know, I just find another firm because we're not really focused on enterprise software or whatever, you know, category. We had some, you know, sort of legacy small startups that had smaller budgets and, you know, just sort of like, you know, just we kept spending time and cycles on them. And I was just like, there's too many more, there's too, too, too many big opportunities in here. I don't want to, unless somebody's really paying a lot of money, we still cut Phillips out as a client, but yeah. um, unless somebody's really paying a, a big, a big chunk of change, we, we, we really didn't want to, uh, you know, deal with anything other than blockchain companies on the PR side. And then, you know, I spent a lot more time growing coin agenda and, um, you know, started to do more advisory work and investing. And um, that's really where we expanded into the, you know, sort of full swath of uh, services that we do today, including um, in 2014, near the end of it, I um, uh, connected with Jim Blasco um, mm -hmm. in Las Vegas, um, who, you know, I, I, I like to say I, I found him hidden under a rock at a mining show. Um, I mean, I thought I knew all the people in, 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 in crypto in, in Vegas, and I'd never run across Jim because he spends all of his days, you know, in a cave programming. And he, he came out and had a little 10 by 10 booth and he had like all these interesting projects he was working on. I was like, you know, where have you been hiding? And he's like, oh yeah, you know, I kind of do this stuff on my own and you know, mm -hmm. I, I just don't know how to market it. And so I kind of took him under my wing and, um, you know, he became sort of our, um, our, our technology partner and we built a number of different uh, uh, tokens for hire that were all sort of based on um, proof of work because that was his passion. And, um, you know, and so we've been working together since then. And um, I launched in 2015 an incubator called B Commerce Labs. And mm -hmm. it was really to kind of fund my ideas and Jim's ideas. And the first one to actually get out of the lab and launch is Aspire, which went live um, on July 4th weekend. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Yes. And congratulations. We're, um, we're, all, we're almost at the present. The timeline's almost caught up. What it also caught me during the conversation is you started Bit Angels. It was successful. The, there was efficiency in having that group, but there was an inefficiency of how everyone was getting together. So again, applying your hacker mentality, that seems to float, float you know, I can't even speak. I need more coffee. That seems to have resulted in coin, <laughs> coin agenda seems to be an efficiency hack for, for getting the Bit Angels together. And then it kind of yeah, so, so right, exactly. Because what had happened a lot of times was, 
um, we would end up having the bit angels go and say, hey, let's get together at this show or that show. And, um, you know, I mean, sometimes it worked well. I mean, we had a little, you know, kind of party that, that uh, uh, you know, at, um, uh, at, at, at I think the, um, the December 2013 uh, Inside Bitcoins, it was in Las Vegas. So mm -hmm. we just had, you know, you know got, got a sponsor, got a little after party. And uh, that was, that was, you know, we got probably 70 or 80 bit angels together there. And then I remember um, that next spring, it was pouring rain in New York and we were trying to get bit angels together for a bit angels breakfast. And I think mm -hmm. we had like David, me and like one other person show up because it was raining so badly. And I was just wow. like, you know, this needs to be a more formalized effort. And at that point, Dave was really moving, you know, more into, um, you know, chairman of factum, uh, Mastercoin, you know, what, what became, you know, his other investment advisory efforts. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, we uh, made an agreement that I'd sort of take over the next wave of, uh, of bit angels, the, um, uh, the, the network. And uh, he, he went on to concentrate to, uh, you know, really um, finishing out the, uh, the fund and, um, uh, and then, you know, going on to doing, you know, YCG and the things he's doing today. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, part of my vision um, for <clears throat> Bit Angels was to, A, make it a true membership uh, a group where uh, just like a New York Angels or a Corezzo Forum where, you know, you have accredited investors in the U.S. and token buyers or whatever other form you have of, 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 of you know, qualified investors internationally. And they pay a certain amount per year to get access to to, to, to the deal flow. Um, you probably have a, a period of time where you count them in to learn about it. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, and then the companies get to present for free and they get to present in person because I've always thought that the, the in-person part is just, you know, I mean, you can see this on Zoom, right? I mean, um, we're having a great conversation here. I can't see the audience. I can see their, mm -hmm. their, their names. Uh, and, you know, afterwards, if you have a breakout room, you can do maybe, you know, one per person talking at a time in this big thing. It's different than being at a conference and, you know, going and having coffee or drinks or dinner with people afterwards. And so, you know, the physical will always be something that, you know, once we're able to safely gather again, that will be important. So we built Bit Angels out now under Erica to uh, 15 uh, cities. Um, some of the chapters were getting together monthly, like Austin under Matt McKibben and, mm -hmm. and Arena. Um, and, um, Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, um, you know, New York was getting 75 people every, every, every month. And so, you know, and then the pandemic hit. So, um, in fact, my last, my last time, my last time outside of, uh, you know, lockdown was, uh, um, you know, the, the last week in February when I spoke at the NFT conference and, um, we did a bit angels event in, in person and, you know, I miss them though, they'll be back. Yeah, it's, oh, Pedro's joining. We got more people kind of joining in. But by the way, my, my chat is blowing up. You're, you're very popular. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's why I'm off. But it, I, I, okay, so I, I love it. The, you, you had your PR brain, you go to this conference, your brain explodes with magic internet money. You also are, are smart enough to learn from the lessons from before. You get to, you know, you bond with the people in this, you know, with your fellow your fellow early advisors, deans, uh, you have an efficiency fat hack. <laughs> I, 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 li I like Dean. My, my, my prior one was uh, um, uh, Rand Nunier from uh, CNBC's called me like the godfather of crypto or the godfather of ICOs. So I like the Dean. Yeah, <laughs> Dean. Yeah, you know, the, 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 the god, you know, the, yeah, the godfather, you, you're still, you're still active in your career. You're still kicking butt. So it's the Dean. Godfather. You take over the family. I'm gonna be drinking. Right, water. right. So yeah. the Dean's a little more elegant. I, I I I like it. And so the 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 nexus between you advising, I think, over a hundred ICOs and taxes and regulation led to your yet another hack, which is your Puerto Rico discovery and your Puerto right. Rico trailblazing. Can you talk about that? And sure. So I I I well, I guess the first hack with Puerto Rico was just realizing, like I did with moving to Nevada in 2006, um, because I just 
didn't see any reason to be spending 40% of, um, you know, my um, um, uh, exits um, in California tax. And, you know, when, for example, I knew that there would eventually be an exit for market wire and, uh, um, you know, we were a global company and I didn't, you know, I mean, the board meetings were in San Francisco. We had offices all over the place. And so I didn't need to physically be in California to still be chairman of, uh, I'd already moved up uh, to chairman from CEO. We mm -hmm. recruited a new CEO. Um, and, um, you know, I moved to Nevada and I saved 40% of my taxes and also I think a better lifestyle. Um, and so when all of a sudden I learned about the Puerto Rico tax breaks, um, which I know you did a show on that, um, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was very compelling um, to be able to move down there and pay zero capital gains on, you know, all the crypto and stock and everything else that you acquire after the date of the move. Um, mm -hmm. And then also to have a company where, you, uh, as a services company, where you only pay 4% to Puerto Rico, and zero to the IRS, and zero to the IRS and capital gains. And so, um, you know, I have been in investigating that for a while. And then when I realized that 2016 was going to probably be a pretty big year in terms of, uh, you know, uh, earning cryptocurrency, um, mm -hmm. I talked to my wife and said, you know, we're going to pay a lot of, you know, we don't pay state tax. We're going to pay a, an awful lot of federal tax at top rates if I do, if I sell things within a you know, year um, mm -hmm. or we can move to Puerto Rico. And she's like, I know nothing about Puerto Rico except West Side Story. And so I said, great, mm -hmm. let's take a trip down there, see whether there's gang members who sing um, and if we like it, we'll move. And so we went down in February and um, I hacked myself into getting a speaking gig at a conference that was uh, on, on, on how to become a, uh, uh, you know, Act 2022, which are the names of the programs. Got to meet all the different providers um, and, and government officials. And uh, that's where I found Giovanni Mendez. He was a BDO at the time. I think he's still mm -hmm. the best guy uh, in, in the biz for that. Um, now his own company, GEO. Uh, yeah. He was on your show with Pedro. Shout out to everyone. Um, and, um, you know, haven't looked back. I mean, uh, I, you know, it's obviously challenging being in a place that, you know, gets big hurricanes and has some infrastructure problems and has their fights with Trump and, you know, mm -hmm. et cetera. But uh, it's, uh, you know, wonderful people, wonderful weather, um, you know, great, uh, you know, uh, neighborhoods. And um, so I love it when I'm there in the winter and spring. I'm there pretty much from end of October through um, middle of May. And then most years I spend, uh, you know, June and early July in Western Europe, not this year. And then um, I've got about, you know, three, four months that I spend in Las Vegas and the West Coast. Interesting. And uh, one of the, we're getting a few questions in the chat and it kind of dovetails with this, which is you're clever about jurisdiction selection and sort of jurisdictional arbitrage, maybe even in the time of COVID especially, and that yeah. led you to Puerto Rico, but that also seems to have led you to Bermuda. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, so uh, being in Puerto Rico that is in the heart of the Caribbean, and mm -hmm. so I got to know a lot of the jurisdictions down there, um, and, you know, after the, you know, kind of July 2016 Dow um, uh, guidance, um, all of a sudden people started really looking much more seriously at just banning the U.S. and doing token sales, you know, in Cayman, primarily in BVI, in Singapore. And so I started talking to a number of, you know, lawyers in those places, U.S. lawyers about, you know, how you most effectively avoid the U.S. presence. And, you know, 2016 and 2017, it was pretty easy to do that because if you did it offshore and you didn't, uh, you know, sort of onboard, um, you know, the money back into the U.S., you were able to keep it offshore. When Trump came in, um, in, 20, in you know, early 2018, he created the, the Guilty uh, uh, Act, which basically, I, I like to say you're guilty until proven innocent, but, um, you know, part of that whole, um, you know, uh, group of uh, legislations um, and regulations was that you were, not, you were no longer able to kind of like park money offshore. I mean, his, his whole theory was that I'm going to like force the apples of the world to come back into the U.S. and pay their fair share. They continue to do like even way more sophisticated tricks than, you know, I'm what contemplating in crypto. 
What was well, the one that Steve, the one that Steve Jobs created many years ago, was called the Double Dutch or the Irish Twist, and that was basically Ireland. You know, said that they'll do four percent tax um, if you run things through Ireland for the EU. Um, mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, for pro for for um, um, uh, intellectual property. So Apple figured out a way of saying every iPhone I sell, every Mac I sell. You know, the difference between the, the raw metal that I buy from China, the parts. And the finished product isn't the product sale, it's an IP sale. Yeah. And I guess they must have gotten Irish courts to back them up. They spent a lot of money in Ireland. Um, but they, you know, they only paid four percent. Right? I'm sorry? They won recently against the EU when they, they won against the EU because the EU thought they were getting too good of a deal. And Ireland was like, Yeah, but we're creating a lot of jobs and we like this. And um, so they uh, that's the Irish part. The double Dutch is they would take the money that they would sell from like, you know, their whole EMEA, um, you know, sort of uh, um, uh, universe of uh, clients, the customers, and then they would, they would um, move the money to Amsterdam for about five minutes, have a bunch of guys there to count the money, and there was no tax going from Ireland to, to Netherlands. And then um, from the Netherlands, uh, where you're you know, filming at least part of this from, mm -hmm. um, it would then go down to Curaçao, which was the Dutch, you know, West Indies, and um, there was no tax going there. So all of a sudden you're collecting all the stuff inside the EU and you're effectively in the Caribbean outside the EU and it would just park there and not pay any taxes until, you know, um, oftentimes it's last way of getting back in the US is they would then invest that money into a venture capital arm of, of uh, Apple in, in Reno, Nevada. And so that was, that was this brilliant full circle of, uh, you know, um, jurisdictional arbitrage, which, is, you know, uh, it, as they say, it's not what you earn, it's what you keep. And so a lot of other big companies have been following that. And Puerto Rico is sort of the Ireland of, uh, of the US. Uh, Microsoft um, mm -hmm. runs something called Microsoft Caribbean, um, which basically sells all of the copies of Microsoft Office in the cloud for North America, Central America, South America. I mean, that's a lot of money. A and lot. they pay for they pay four percent to Puerto Rico and they don't pay the IRS, and so so, the, so you you kind of like the Chinese in that you re innovate you look at what others have done take it apart put it back together and then improve it. Can we talk about the the Bermuda Triangle? Sure, the Bermuda Bermuda Triangle is the nickname. It's probably going to be called something like you know PSAS, private sales of surface, or you know I, I don't even want to have the token word in because it can be used for other types of sales, but. Uh, but they're mm -hmm. private sales, they're not public sales, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I, I helped brainstorm this with a number of attorneys. I'll give a shout out to Giovanni because he really helped me figure out the Puerto Rico angle. Um, mm -hmm. So um, of all the uh, you know Caribbean and North, and North Atlantic uh, jurisdictions that I was studying, and I've traveled around to a lot of them, um, I was a co-founder with Gabe Abbott and, um, and uh, Roger Veer of the Caribbean Blockchain Association in early 2015. Um, and um, Bermuda um, has always been a top tier jurisdiction and you know, their new premier um, really wanted to become a leader in you know, sort of the cryptocurrency uh, area. And mm -hmm. he comes from a tech background, 39 years old when he was uh, elected, five year term, very popular. And um, he's like, you know, um, let's figure out a way of letting you know, um, uh, businessmen uh, and women, um, you know, innovate and do things in Bermuda. And what I liked mm -hmm. about Bermuda was unless you're doing an exchange, in which case you need four people on the ground in a physical office in Bermuda. But if you're simply, um, you know, having your corporate headquarters there and you're issuing digital assets, they have an ICO law, um, which is if you're doing a public sale, um, mm -hmm. it was originally over 35. Um, and new legislation is going to bring it to over 150. So if you're under 150, which these days, again, a private sale is not going to be to that many people. It's going to be like sure. two people, 10 people. And um, you're able to go and do it in Bermuda without having to hire, you know, Bermuda people, without having to have your board meetings in Bermuda like you have to do in Barbados and in uh, mm -hmm. Caymans. And so I just found it to be the friendliest jurisdiction, took a bunch of trips down there, got to know the people, um, hired a great law firm down there. And, um, you know, and then ran what we came up with between Bermuda and, um, and um, uh, Puerto Rico uh, to the U.S. to make sure that we were, you know, sort of like fully 
you know, being out of the U.S. And so mm -hmm. I, I think that it's not enough to just simply block U.S. investors because after guilty, you still have to pay 10.5% of your, of your proceeds versus 21% if you did it in Wyoming. With the Bermuda Triangle, as I call it, doing the token sale in uh, Bermuda by airdropping your tokens to us and then we build your blockchain for you in Puerto Rico, that effectively removes your presence as a 51% controlled company because you're just giving us a bounty to build your blockchain. You no, no longer have um, you know, sort of a, um, ownership of, of, of the blockchain development that happens um, on a project basis from the proceeds of your initial token sale. And um, we, we build it in Puerto Rico where blockchain is considered software as a service. And if that's done through an Act 20 company, which mm -hmm. I have, that's owned by an Act 22 person, which I am, um, it pays 4% and nothing to the IRS. Wow. And then so roughly 0.1% to the city of San Juan. Which is a great city, is very much metropolitan, you told me, and needs the money so that they can keep on being awesome. So. Absolutely, and then and then we we take our fees out of the difference between the ten point one and the uh, and the um, and the four point one or the ten point five and the four point one, and you know it's typically three to five points depending on what else we're doing. Interesting. And then the, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bridge over from that to you know, we did the origin story. Now it's like, what have you done for me lately? Let's talk about Aspire and what sure. that talk about. Why right, so Aspire, Aspire is, um, uh, you know, Jim Blasco's baby. Um, he came up with the idea for it um, in early 2017. And it's basically taking uh, the open source co code for Counterparty, which is also the open source code that Ravencoin evolved out of, which is now a $150 million market cap. And, um, you know, Counterparty XCP was, um, you know, the, the, the digital asset creation uh, platform for 30% of the top 100 tokens in 2014, 2015, into early 2016, because it was very easy to program. It was much easier to program than, say, Omni, which also let you create um, um, uh, digital assets. But I mean, I think there's probably about 10 Omni programmers in the world, whereas, you know, Counterparty is, is much easier to sort of teach yourself. And there's, a, there's a lot more Counterparty programmers out there. And um, you know, so you're, you're able to go in and have this asset layer that, that rides on top of Bitcoin for security. Um, the problem was that when the price of uh, Bitcoin gas went up, when it was $20 a transaction instead of 20 cents, as we were leaning in toward uh, the scaling wars and, and SegWit, um, you know, prior to SegWit, everybody abandoned Counterparty. And because Counterparty did their token sale and burned the Bitcoin they received, because they a thought legally harder to go after them if they didn't keep the money, right. um, but then you know they ran out of money. Surprise! You know you, if you hadn't burned your two thousand Bitcoin that you raised, you would have probably you know had like you know as much funding, relatively speaking, as the Ethereum Foundation in terms of being able to continue to go on for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know the, the, the three founders left and did other things. You're making a beautiful point, which is the the regulatory weirdness of the United States creates incentives for inefficient action, like defensive action Correct. that has economic, that has real world impact on people's behavior, people's behavior and the success or failure of projects. Correct. Have and so uh, again, that was sort of a, uh, <laughs> a, a lesson in, in what not to do. <laughs> um, so, but uh, Counterparty, which is, you know, we actually did the PR for Counterparty back in those days. Um, you know, is a uh, really good technology and it's open source and, you know, Ravencoin ended up like taking the open source, modifying it to make it into a mineable token. And uh, like I said, they're $150 million market cap just of their circulating coins. And they're, you know, I don't think they're even 20% near, um, you know, total uh, mined uh, authorized tokens. Right. Um, so, you know, fully distributed, they're, you know, closer to a billion dollars. Uh, potential market cap. Um, and um, so Aspire basically was to look at the counterparty code and to basically um, make it with a different gas coin. And so it's a two token solution. There's Aspire um, and Aspire Gas. And Aspire Gas is the equivalent of Bitcoin. 
but with lower, low, much lower fees. So um, the transactions on Aspire Gas um, are on the order of like, you know, uh, I think it's, it's over a thousand per token. So you get one token and you're going to be good for your gas for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and then, uh, and then Aspire Gas is, is required to build your a asset, just like Aspire Gas is the Bitcoin, what counterparty is to Aspire. And so Aspire is the token that you need to then create additional ecosystems on top of it. And you can go to Aspire Wallet right now, and we're having a, um, uh, a bounty for the first 10,000 developers through the end of the year to be able to create free assets. Um, you can create a free asset anytime without giving it a name. Uh, to give it a name, um, you are required to um, uh, spend 10 Aspire or to u utilize a 10 Aspire. I mean, right now there's no price on Aspire because it's not listed on, on any markets, but you know, mm -hmm. eventually one would think that would be the case. And um, you know, that's, it's, affordable. I'm sorry? It still sounds pretty affordable. Like it, yes, it, that's the whole idea is to make it very affordable, yes. So it's not like Ethereum gas fees these days. Yeah, no, I mean, Ethereum, um, you know, is um, uh, was where a lot of people who, when they left Counterparty, went to. Mm -hmm. um, because, um, you know, they were, they were finding it was $20 to do a transaction in Bitcoin and, you know, more like 20 cents on Ethereum. And then all of a sudden its price started heading up. And so this is something where, you know, the price of doing uh, gas on a spiral always be, you know, arguably sub one penny. Interesting. Um, this is fantastic. So we're, we're going to go to the, the famed alumni speaker open mic section. Uh, we have a lot of really good people here. Um, I'm going to bring in your, your entrepreneurial cohort, Dave Johnston. Uh, Dave, you're, and we also got Giovanni Mendez going to join us. So, you know, fantastic. You know, I, I, everyone knew they were being talked about and, you know, and couldn't, didn't dare not be on, but you know, <laughs> Just for everyone, um, uh, someone named first name, last name has entered the room for the meeting. I don't think so. Oh, I guess they're coming in. If, if that's a Zoom bombing, we're gonna have to eliminate them. Uh -oh. I, I, Dave Johnston, I, I, as usual, I love your background. Good to see you. And see you. So here I am with two deans. You know, we, we, we got <laughs> Dean Majoris and Dean, I, I'm not gonna say minors because you know, you're both deans, but anyways. You know what? Why don't you say hello to Michael and throw some stuff at him? Hey, great to uh, great to see you, Michael. Always really cool to remember the journey that we've been on these last yep. seven years. So um, I love the way you sort of recount those those early days. And yeah, it's been a pretty amazing journey. I remember all those Bitcoin supper clubs. I think I was at fourteen yep. or fifteen of them in a row uh, as we're going to all those conferences. But you know, no, it's 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 quite the uh, quite the quite the journey. I, I guess I'm uh, curious. Uh, you know, we're seeing this next wave form, right? We saw the Bitcoin wave, then we saw the ICO wave. Uh, now, I would characterize it probably as a DeFi wave with all the projects that are are coming with the pipeline. Curious what you're seeing out there. What uh, what you're I, I would I, I think there's two new waves that are coming, and they're both uh, fairly reliant on Ethereum, which is why you've seen the price you know, double in not too long of a period of months. Um, DeFi, I think, took people uh, by, by storm, right? Because, you know, if you figure that the first, um, you know, sort of use case of uh, Bitcoin, the first two use cases were store of value and, 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 you know, instantaneous global payments that are secure and can't be uh, confiscated. Um, the, and then maybe the third one was, uh, you know, sort of the fundraising from the ERC-20, um, this, this DeFi solves the problem of zero and negative interest rates. And yeah. where are you able, if you're a conservative investor, to be able to do better? And, you know, probably yield farming isn't for the conservative investor, but, you know, you go in and you get 9% interest on ABRA, on USDT, and, and like, you know, some of the fairly high interest rates on Celsius, and some of the loans on SALT, I mean, in Nexo. I mean, there's conservative, as I think we called it in last uh, month's uh, Coin Agenda Virtual on DeFi. We call it DeFi and CeFi because there's centralized finance. But, uh, um, you know, I think that the DeFi is, is just blowing up. And I think that it's going to drag in a lot of, um, you know, curious uh, traditional investors 
who appeared before had only been looking at Bitcoin and now going, what do you mean I can make 9% on my money? Right. All of a sudden, those 7 to 9% yields sound pretty great when banks aren't, they're not offering interest anymore. They don't do that. That's, that's all no. that. No. <laughs> exactly. So, Maybe there's so, negative. Yeah. And, and then the other thing I, the other, the other thing I think that is getting ready to explode, it's not there yet, but it will, um, is going to be NFTs and, um, you know, gaming and collectibles and, um, you know, and that's largely right now on ERC 721, but, uh, other platforms could do it. Um, colored coins, you know, goes back to the OG days and, uh, and counterparty can, can, you know, issue um, uh, non-fungible tokens on top of it. And so we're looking to do some of that on Aspire. And then on the Aspire roadmap, we're also um, able to go and recreate the code that um, Adam Krellenstein did to say, um, I can recreate um, the Ethereum virtual machine in 400 lines of code. And there was a little pissing match between him and Vitalik at the time. Mm -hmm. Vitalik's like, no, you can't. And uh, Krellenstein a couple of weeks later said, yes, I did. Here it is. And nobody ever ran it. Nobody ever debugged it. And, and Adam left Counterparty after that. So Jim Blasco went and ran it, debugged it. And that's sort of on our roadmap to have basically the ability to run any uh, Ethereum virtual machine, any ERC contract on, um, on Aspire for you know, far less gas. Right. So, so in that way, yeah, our crypto could be joining in. Yeah. Oh, there we go. I have a poodle wandering around somewhere, but I think she's still in bed. This one started making noises, and I this is the oh. even this is the less disruptive version. So I've also brought on uh, this is going to be free for all. Hopefully it won't behave. So I brought on Professor. I always like to say the Wolf Call, our resident uh, regulatory and reputation genius, very good with Dallas. Giovanni Mendez, uh, hi guys, the collaborator on Puerto Rican Act Twenty and Twenty Two matters with Michael. Uh, Luke Stokes will be with us in a moment. Uh, Pedro, if you can join us. Uh, I'm here. Good, uh, good morning, fellas. Uh, we, we got hey, Michael, I just want to tell you, you're looking great, by the way. You're one of the very few people I know, especially in your age group, which I'm not going to mention how old you actually are. But <laughs> you're looking great, by the way. You're one of the very few people that during the coronavirus, your weight has gone the opposite direction. So keep it up, my brother. Thank you. I lost 20 pounds. So um, I, figure, I figured that, uh, you know, if I'm going to be... Uh, stuck in one place or two places, Puerto Rico and, uh, and Vegas, that I might as well uh, work out more and, 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 and you know, uh, get on a uh, low, low carb diet and a keto you know. diet. And so, yeah, so I've lost, I've lost 20 pounds. I seem to get stuck right at that 20 pounds. I want to lose another 10, but, uh, but yeah, it's all good. Thank you. Stop looking, stop looking at the scale, my brother. Just pay attention to your body, man. You're looking <laughs> good. As long as you're healthy, man, that's the important part, bro. Thank you. Indeed. Uh, Professor, Professor Call, I, I, you know, you always have good, insightful, tricky questions. So, you know, you guys, nice time. I don't know if you know each other, but you should. And Wolf, go for it. Hi, Michael. Um, I really enjoyed Hi. the uh, perspective and the historical um, evaluation that you presented. Um, really appreciate that. But I wanted to maybe uh, change tack a little bit and talk about the future. Uh, and that's a little tricky in the crypto community. I've written a lot of pieces about how we are um, insufficiently set up from an infrastructure product perspective. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering what your take is on future development, where I'm wondering where you see innovation coming from, and I'm wondering what your take on the DAO community is. So um, the DAO community is still um, it depends what it's used for, right? Because um, the, the DAO, <laughs> as opposed to a DAO, um, you know, uh, was chosen by the SEC, singled out because I think it couldn't be ignored. Um, you know, it, it fulfilled all the things that, that, that they want to go after something uh, that they can't ignore. People lost money. Uh, there was $60 million stolen. Um, and, um, and, and it also was clearly a security. I mean, all these things that may or may not, or, you know, very gray area, there was no gray area on that. I mean, you were going and giving money to then uh, receive uh, uh, dividends from the success of it. And that, that is a security, right? I mean, so that is, you are dependent on the um, active efforts of management or others. And, um, you know, so until they come up with some kind of 
sufficiently decentralized management as opposed to sufficiently decentralized ownership, um, token holding, um, you're still gonna have issues with the SEC. Um, and, uh, you know, again, maybe it's a security token, but those don't seem to be, you know, on fire these days. Um, and so, you know, I think that there's a lot of theoretical stuff. I mean, at the time of the Dow, um, there were a lot of, you know, Harvard, MIT discussions on, you know, how the Dow is above the law because it's decentralized and, you know, pretty much uh, the SEC said, if you can fog a mirror and you're involved in selling the Dow, you're personally responsible. And so that's really kind of where the Dow's stuck. I mean, I think there's certainly um, models for decentralization. Bitcoin certainly proved it. Um, I think that going forward, tokenization um, is equally as important as decentralization. Decentralization is not required for um, blockchain. Um, it is required for things that uh, require um, uh, you know, trustlessness and, and just trust in math. So I don't want to go and trust, you know, a place that could take my money if that's what the main thing is. But, um, you know, I'm fine trusting, you know, the creator of the, uh, you know, comic book Siri NFT. Mm. Interesting. Well, they, you know, knowing you, you have a follow-up. I didn't know you. So. Say again? I said knowing you, you have a follow-up. because I, I didn't know you at this point. Well... <clears throat> So there's the, the, there's the DAO, but then there's the evolving generations of DAOs, right? So the first generation, right. as you say, was, well, it's the Wild West uh, and the law doesn't apply, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have, of course, the SEC coming down on it. Second generation, now people are saying, oh, well, we're still kind of the, the, the Wild West, but we're going to somehow attach a legal wrapper. Third generation now is everybody starts with the legal wrapper saying, well, we need the legal construct first, and then we, we add the, the DAO concept uh, later. I'm wondering, and I don't know if, if you've dabbled in that. Uh, so we at the DevDAO, we, we, I guess, can, can count ourselves um, as third generation here. We believe that in order to build infrastructure, uh, one needs a DAO. There's no way around DAOs because you cannot capitalize and control the evolution of decentralized infrastructure products, right? So you have to have some coordination engine in, in a DAO, third generation DAO, that helps you build decentralized infrastructure. And I'm just wondering if you have any perspectives on, on, on that concept. Well, I, I, again, I think that decentralized um, you know, ecosystems will be part of what blockchain has in the future, but will not be everything. Um, there are you know, many in the top 100 you know, centralized um, or semi-centralized, um, you know, uh, DAOs, uh, sorry, um, tokens. And, you know, look, there's Bitcoin maximalists who think everything other than Bitcoin's a scam. There is um, decentralization maximalists. Um, you know, I mean, David, David Johnston, while not a maximalist, uh, does have Johnson's law about uh, anything that can be decentralized will be decentralized. But, um, you know, I think that there still is a place for, you um, you know, uh, uh, innovation where you have an entity that is using the blockchain and is not decentralized. And um, there's a place for decentralized and there's a place for, um, you know, uh, centralized. And just like there's a place for, for private and permission blockchains. Yeah, I, 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 personally, I personally do not see, especially not the United States government, I do not see the United, not the way it's currently constructed, right? There could be some, some major changes on the horizon that none of us are aware of. But the way that the United States government's currently constructed, I cannot see them ever going to commissionless, uh, decentralized blockchains for their services. Um, so that's a prime example of what I could see as being centralized. Block. Like for instance, take, take for instance, the World Bank as, as, as an international level. I can't ever see the, the World Bank ever going to a decentralized system. However, I well, can see them very much taking the switch over to a, a centralized blockchain a, system. A, a, a real good example is decentralized exchanges. I mean, the SEC has gone after them and tried to shut them down one by one um, when they could find a person involved. Now, you know, you may get to the next generation of decentralized exchanges where you know, you can't even figure out who the person is other than the coders, but then they go after the coders. I mean, that's been sort of, you know, with this travel rule and this and that. So, I mean, we still have a few things to sort out in terms of, uh, you know, um, regulation and the harm it can do. I mean, FATF is, uh, you know, something that uh, can really cripple 
the entire industry. Um, Giovanni, I say, say, yep. say hi to the other Dean. And I'd like hi guys. to do a little intro of yourself and talk efficiently about 2022 and what you've done for Rico, including with Michael. Yeah, so I'm a tax attorney in Puerto Rico. I'm licensed here in Puerto Rico and, and in the U.S. tax court. Um, I've done a lot of work in the for the Act 2022 community. I've assisted over 300 um, businesses and individuals relocate here, including uh, Michael Turpin, which is the first uh, crypto investor to move under Act 22. So we've been working together for about um, something like four years, I, I think. Sometimes it feels like more. Um, yeah. So, so um, yeah, and very early adopter in the analysis of tax consequences for the crypto industry. Um, obviously, from uh, l looking for how the incentives can help um, and how we can minimize impact, but also um, helping anal analyze and predict what the regulatory landscape will look like. And, and then uh, quickly, Act 22, or what used to be Act 22, now Act 60, offers uh, tax-free capital gains to uh, investors that relocate to Puerto Rico. Um, and the same for interest and dividends that are sourced to Puerto Rico. And in the case of Act 20, now also Act 60, it's for businesses that provide services from Puerto Rico to clients outside Puerto Rico. And <clears throat> that would be taxed, that net income would be taxed at 4%. So both great incentives. Um, what we found you know, during the years is that uh, blockchain technology evolves a lot faster than regulation that can adopt to it. You know, we have many things that are not regulated at all. At all so we need to apply analogy and analysis to see where the IRS, you know, what they've said and where they might go. And I think DeFi um, presents that once again. And then once again, Puerto Rico also becomes the answer, you know, I think a lot of people in, in the, you know, there's the schools of thought for the DeFi market on whether it is interest and it's taxed at interest as interest, or it seems more like, you know, the IRS would side would say, no, this is going to be ordinary income um, because it's not exactly interest. And, and as that evolves and whatever agreements or structures um, evolve, it seems that, you know, either way, Puerto Rico is going to be the answer to, you know, moving here or establishing a business from here to take advantage of the legal structure and 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 the tax advantages you know to to avoid this uncertainty and potentially adverse effect that you know you're going to have tax wise you know this is very very important you know all these streams of of income same as capital gains at one point um or you know when it was ICOs or whatnot we've found solutions within uh, the legal framework of Puerto Rico and its interplay with the U.S. code on how to take advantage. So, so I think that's where we're at right now. Um, the relevance of Puerto Rico just, just, you know, becomes more and more clear. And, and, and I'm sure, sure Michael knows that. I, I, yeah, yes. I, I think Michael is co-creator to a certain extent. And just for the audience and for the long tail of this, it's not just that you show up to Puerto Rico in 20 and 22 and the subsequent acts apply. There's certain specific requirements, I think, for residency or time there, and for the business aspect, it's certain channels or certain categories of business that apply yeah. to Yeah, so for business, um, we're looking at, well, there's there's many different incentives here. You know, we do have incentive for local business, for agriculture, manufacturing, et cetera. But with the technology wave, what we focus mm -hmm. on is export services. It's businesses that provide uh, services from Puerto Rico, you know, feet on the ground here to clients outside of Puerto Rico. And I said, you know, feet on the ground, but you, we can take specific examples like, you know, for example, Microsoft. Well, they have a few employees here in Puerto Rico and then a lot of servers. And they, they, mm -hmm. they provide um, the Microsoft Office uh, software as a service. All the, the uploads occur from Puerto Rico and that's how they source their income here from a business uh, standpoint. From a personal standpoint, you need to comply with three tests, which is a tax home test, closer connections test and presence test. The presence test is the most known as being in Puerto Rico for 183 days. But there are other alternatives um, into com to complying for that test. And it's very important for people that are digital nomads. If you spend less than 90 days in the US in any given year, then 
you don't have the 183 minimum in Puerto Rico. You can actually spend less time in Puerto Rico. Also, if you spend more than uh, 90 days in the U.S., but you still spend at least 153 in Puerto Rico, then you can count up to 30 days that you spent uh, traveling in foreign countries as Puerto Rico days. So, you know, there, there's ways around it and there's flexibility. But there, there's definitely a need to work with, I mean, I'm going to give you a plug. There's definitely a need to work with an expert uh, yeah. like you because <laughs> yeah. you know, they're the dragons. Yeah. Right. This is yeah. This is the the, the the two minute quick rundown. But of course, there are very specific situations, and we need to vet and validate. Um, but but you know it is it is real. I've been through audit processes with the IRS, including blockchain investors that have been audited, um, that live in Puerto Rico, and we've had successful results, just following the guidelines. Got it. And I want to I want to welcome also we got. Pavel Kravchenko, hopefully he'll unmute himself. Um, he was one of the guests for our Distributed Finance show. He is the instigator of the founder of Distributed Lab in Kiev, uh, sorry, in Kharkov, Ukraine. And I'm chief legal officer of Distributed. So I got a, I got a dog in that fight. Hello. Hey, Pavel. Good to see you. Pavel's got a story of a beard. Look at this. Pavel, you <laughs> got a So just mute yourself for a second, but keep the video on. And we'll get to you, but I'm happy to see you. Uh, Marco, uh, future speaker, current collaborator. Um, you guys don't know each other, you should definitely meet Marco. It's just a, I mean, takes Excel jockeying, apply it, you know, that's such a little microcosm, but what do you do with spreadsheets and modeling? Freaks me out. And by, are you by the pool with your shirt off? I just gotta ask. Well, I, it's bloody hot here. I'm just saying. <laughs> Is here the Cayman Islands? Yes, sir. Awesome. So say hi to Mike and, and hit him. Hey, yeah, Michael, uh, well, first off, I loved your uh, chat about uh, your early days uh, when you were asking lawyers uh, whether you could do this or not and then paying a bloody fortune for the answer that was no. Um, yeah. I come across that quite a bit in my early career as well, uh, more the 90s and the 80s. Um, but uh, it was, I found it fascinating because I realized that the only way to really be an entrepreneur in any space that touches the legal frame is to learn the law yourself, yeah. uh, at least enough exactly. that you can, you can tell when a lawyer is prevaricating. <laughs> yep. Yeah, the problem is that uh, the only we, prevaricating. <laughs> exactly. I mean, well, Gordon, we, we've been through this just recently. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. Or, or, or trying not to say, I don't know. <laughs> so, Marco, I mean, Mar a lot of us on this show, Luke, uh, Luke Stokes included, Wolf, we're working on the DevDAO project. And when, whenever, you know, I'm helping, I'm working uh, with Wolf on the legal. And whenever the topic goes to like Kanye West or something, I, I might, you know, my uh, cliche comment is, okay, guys, this is where I send you a bill, which is, you know, <laughs> you know there's, 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 there's exactly. like, not billable and there's billable. Um, so let, let's get, sorry, Marco, did you, uh, I'm feeling the love for Michael. Did you have a question you wanted to throw at Mike? Well, um, yeah, I, I was going to add in that there's a pretty major uh, move happening here and it ties into pretty much everything crypto. Uh, and this is obviously, as you probably know, Gordon, and Luke definitely knows, is a little pet project of mine, uh, is decentralized self-sovereign identity uh, as a way to make everything else work much more smoothly. Uh, most of the problems that we face with, with the crypto adoption to the general masses falls into the problem of managing your keys. Uh, and uh, and your addresses uh, and and things that are just not intuitive to use and a self-sovereign decentralized digital identity solution which is a very tricky little problem to solve uh, is really the optimal way to solve that problem because once you've gotten them identified into some sort of a digital infrastructure and they're self-sovereign so they control it not some third party you end up with the ability to now uh, 
basically abstract all the other stuff, all your Bitcoin addresses and your Ethereum addresses and your other altcoin addresses, your DeFi addresses, and even your existing logins and things that you do uh, for standard traditional services, you can abstract all of that because you now have a way to uniquely prove you are who you say you are, which is the purpose of a login anyway. And I think that's a huge uh, piece of uh, work that needs to get done sooner rather than later to allow for the mass adoption of crypto infrastructures. So pause. Okay. What do you think, Michael? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, that's <laughs> you're waiting for me to ask the question. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, look, I mean, there's a lot of interesting projects out there. I mean, certainly, um, I think that whether it's self-sovereign or decentralized or, or just simply uh, a good solution, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, um, Vinny Lingam with uh, Civic started uh, looking for how to solve the, you know, KYC once and, uh, you know, be able to use it multiple times. And obviously you can do this with, you know, uh, other areas like uh, universal key management, et cetera. So not a project that I'm, I've been exploring, but uh, certainly um, I can see the need for it. And if there's a need for it and blockchain can solve it, it'll, it'll happen. And, you know, and, and I don't see any regulatory issues with that one. Interesting. Uh, Luke, if I could jump in here a little bit, yeah, you, you can ask me. I'm calling you and jump. Come on in. Yeah, I'm no. also on an really? exit call you know, that, I'm, <laughs> that I'm listening into. But uh, I, actually, I think it relates to about DAOs and DACs. It relates to the questions about uh, regulations and securities. It's the idea of like good identity solutions. I tweeted about this this morning, and I think it's really important. I don't know, Marco, like you said, you're working on some incredible ideas that aren't really in the wild yet. I know uh, I've had a lot of conversations with the Wolf about this. I've talked to people like Vinay Gupta and Ian Grigg and others who are like, just don't even touch that with a 10 foot pole because you know, you'll be creating the tools for your own enslavement if you build a really good identity solution for governments that are violent, right? And so I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on decentralized identity solutions that can't be used to control us by governments, but at the same time, the importance of them. You know, we need reputation, we need identity. You know, I'd love to do great giveaways with FIO addresses and FIO tokens, but I can't do it right now because every, every referral program we come up with is open to civil attack. You know, and again, I wanted to say thank you, Michael, for your opportunity to speak at uh, the BitAngels events about FIO and everything. You've been a great supporter. I really appreciate that. And I know we had conversations years ago at, a, a, at the Coin, Coin Agenda in, in, um, about DAX and DAOs and, and your concerns there. Mm -hmm. But if you could just give some thoughts on where does identity play in this whole space and how can we do it in a way that helps businesses interact with each other with reputation and individuals interact with each other, but doesn't create a tool for totalitarian control over our, our privacy and our, our freedom. You know, I think it's a really challenging problem. I haven't seen anyone solve very well. And if you know of someone that are solving it, please let me know because I want to contact them and get involved. Yeah. Well, again, there have been a number of uh, early, you know, stage uh you know um uh again civic um and uh glyph and like i don't know there's probably 20 ones out there uh that you know solve part of the problem or are trying to solve part of the problem we're really early right we haven't we haven't uh, gotten the amazon.com yet of that uh industry um and someone will come up with something and it you know uh it can either be um you know completely decentralized it can just simply be um something that is you know centralized and compliant i mean it's just like you know there'll be several different flavors and the audience will choose what they want i mean you know you may end up having certain centralized platforms say well we need to do something that can be audited by a government and they may have other other ones saying yes we'll accept either the decentralized or the centralized because they both do the same thing they are proof of identity and you don't have to fill out the same damn form over and over again. I mean, it's always frustrating that every time you go and sign up for a new exchange, you have to go and answer the same questions over and over again. Every time you make an investment, you gotta answer the same questions over and over again. This is the time suck, you know? And so if I had, you know, a, uh, a key that I could sign and every question is answered privately and uh, only to those who, you know, are able to have access to that, uh, um, to that, uh, you know, um, part of my file, um, that would be great. Good point. Uh, I just want to, just real quick, I want to give a shout out. We have Peter Bergstrom joining us, uh, you know, founder of Bitblock Ventures, you know, part of Bitcoin Foundation, you know, big dog. Uh, Gideon is on there. He's a 
fluent Russian speaker, which I, I just got through out there, an entrepreneurial gentleman, and Malcolm Tan, uh, my lawyer colleague from Singapore, kind of representing our international audience. Malcolm, I don't know if you can hear me or unmute yourself or show your video. I just want to see your face. As, as much as I bitch about having to do this at 5, 5.30 a.m. when it was dark out here, it's nice to be able to get Europeans and Asians all in the same uh, call, so that's great. Yeah, it yes, is. Hi, guys. We're, we're taking a hit for team. Peter, say hi. I, I, my my oh, video got, no. uh, got stuck, so <laughs> you, you'll have to un... Yeah, you have to open it up in order for you to see. Yeah, okay, that's good. There okay. you go. Hi, hi guys. Hey, man. Hi, hi. hi. It's probably the latest for of any of us here. So it's uh ten twenty p.m. for me. Yep. So I, I just want to. You know, we're, we're kind of we're getting towards the end of the show, but I wanted to say hi. Yep. Do you say hi to hi, say hi to Michael and just give us the, a brief snippet on you and Singapore as a jurisdiction because we've been talking about the Caribbean and Puerto Rico and just. We're bridging the world here. Right. Okay. Um, what I've been extremely busy with uh, over the last three to four months is uh, submitting about 10 plus applications to the MES. MES is the central bank in Singapore, Monetary Authority of Singapore. And uh, Singapore has come up with a new law, uh, which is the Payment Services Act. So Singapore treats utility tokens as payment tokens. So in, in essence, Singapore takes a position, I think very much like Japan, uh, where tokens are considered a medium of exchange. So that really gives rise to a different classification of utility tokens. And so we're very busy right now with um, a lot of applications. Um, there are 400 plus applications over the last six months to get these wow. new licenses in Singapore. So whoever's interested in it, uh, do, do feel free to reach out to me. Got it. And, and you know, another show will have you and Giovanni in a death match. <laughs> that, 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 that'd be cool. uh, Peter. Very, very, very different reasons you go to Singapore or to uh, uh, to Puerto Rico. And uh, yes. Mal Malcolm has been uh, one of our speakers uh, several occasions, really um, talking about, uh, you know, world uh, uh, jurisdictional um, arbitrage and issues. He's one of the best uh, in, in the business there. And he also uh, has been instrumental in us uh, building uh, the Singapore um, Bid Angels chapter. Yes. Right. We just hosted the first Bit Angels uh, a couple of weeks ago. And yeah, yep. I'm, I'm as, as it's a topical thing right now, I'm working on a DeFi project. <laughs> so we are doing the legal structures there so that if there's any government coming knocking, uh, there's a team there to face them. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. Yeah, protect not just against what the regulator, but the regulators, plural. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tim, just one moment, but I, I, I got to give Peter a, a chance to, Peter, I'm happy to reconnect with you after my social media disaster. I'm glad you're on the show. Just quick into a yourself. Yeah, yeah hey, I think last time we met was in Tokyo, I think. Uh, we went to that show in Tokyo a year or so ago. Uh, it's good to be back. Uh, hi, Sander. Hi, Michael. Uh, we had hi. a lot of cooperation on Terra Virtua, which uh, yep. continued to work on a little bit. I think our, our ICO, uh, had some issues, but we were able to raise some money out of Korea and we converted that into uh, a, a friendly relationship with them. Uh, we also okay. kind of retargeted Terra Virtua instead of being a gaming company more to uh, digital collectives. But uh, okay. I've, um, I've, um, we just signed the Godfather license. So we're issuing some Godfather digital collectibles. So we'll see how that oh, works. Great. Um, great, we'll have to catch um, up on that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then um, I think uh, I've been, um, after that, I've, I've been, been in Southeast Asia, uh, mostly in Singapore, but also in uh, Thailand, Malaysia, mm -hmm. Cambodia, and I've uh, been working with digital nomads. And I have a couple of stealth projects. One is, is working on a type of digital nomad on the blockchain. Uh, we work meets uh, uh, digital nomads. Uh, and so that's that's still in the works. Plus, uh, I've also been working a little bit in esports and see how I can put that on on the blockchain in Asia. But now, what happened? I went home to see my parents in Sweden, and uh, I was just going to be here for a few weeks, but uh, everything shut down. So I've had some quality time with my parents, who are very happy to see me as I've been traveling around the world for the last many years. Now I'm stuck here with them, and I'm a little bit what should I say? 
um, impatient to, to start traveling again. But uh, my mother especially says, I hope, I hope they don't open the airports yet. So uh, I'm here. Um, Gideon's doing an interesting move. But I, just because we're short on time, Tim, Tim Lewis, my, my fearless DevDAO leader, just hey. shout out to you. And hey, Gideon. Well, came to just pay my respects to Michael Turpin. Heard he was going to be on today, so I just wanted to uh, pop in and say hello. Thank you. Give the homage. Why is Michael awesome? I'm going to put you on the spot, but you know we all have well, our. He, he, he's been he's he has been at this forever. Uh, Michael is just one of those people that, especially into the second layer of chains, he has been at it you know, really since the beginning of time. He created the ICO model. Um, Bit Angels was you know the, the original ICO, the original pitches for these these products came from. You know, the, the group that Michael founded and put together. Um, so there's, there's, that's just it. I mean, he's got the legacy. He's, he's been, he's been about it, and he continues to work in the space, and uh, you know, always innovative. So always interested in uh, conversations concerning Michael Turpin. Also interested in hearing about. I'm sure you guys have already talked about it, but I uh, would love to to hear the latest. I mean, the, the battle that he's that he has uh, took on for everyone against AT and T, um, and that continual struggle, but. Uh, you know, what's what's the latest with that? I'm sure you guys have covered it, but I, I haven't. Uh, we, 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 we actually didn't cover it, so I guess we'll wrap mm. up with that one. Um, mm. Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously I uh, didn't get willingly dragged into this. I got uh, hacked for $24 million uh, in January of uh, 2018. It was the day of the altcoin moon. Otherwise, those tokens wouldn't have been worth $24 million, but that's what they were. And they got um, immediately laundered uh, through exchanges and converted to Bitcoin and then converted to cash. So that's the amount that, uh, that I was damaged. And, um, you know, it's been a long struggle just sort of working with the FBI and then um, uh, with the U.S. attorney. They did uh, finally make an arrest two years after the fact, uh, Nicholas Truglia. Um, and then, you know, what's frustrating is that the the um, uh, the ringleader, uh, they have not arrested because he's a minor. He was 15 years old at the time, uh, Alice Pinsky. And, um, you know, I have a, a, a default judgment uh, under the RICO Act against Truglia for 75 million, so three times uh, what was stolen. I just have to find out where he's stashing the money because I, I literally have screenshots of one of his treasures with 9,000 Bitcoins on it. So oh um, just a matter of finding where that is. Um, which may or may not ever happen. And then, you know, Pinsky, I've got text messages from him saying that he's got a hundred million dollars stashed offshore. And so we're currently um, uh, in litigation to try to get a similar judgment against him. Um, and um, then AT&T with COVID is just moving very slowly, um, you know, and we are, um, you know, Pinsky, by the way, already paid me back $2 million, so I think that's sort of an admission of guilt. Um, he says that's all he had, but that's not true. Um, and then, um, you know, AT&T has all along said, hey, not our fault. It's how could we ever know after a thousand times that the same thing happens. And in that case, it was, you know, Shaville Smith, who was a, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, retail clerk at Norwich, Connecticut, who got bribed by the gang and gave, gave my uh, account information to the Pinsky gang. And um, so we're gonna try to make them pay for it. And sim simultaneously, I mean, we've got a lawsuit for 24 million plus 200 million in punitive. Um, it will be a jury trial whenever they get around to uh, having juries again. Um, and um, I'm also trying to get the FCC to just simply mandate that um, telephone companies cover their passwords because that would stop it. They're one of the mm -hmm. only industries that you call up and they say, oh, read me your password. I'll see if it, what, what, if it matches my, what's in my computer. Well, that means everybody with access to that can rob you instead of simply having it be um, covered and you have to punch in the password. And if you punch in the password, it's pass fail. That solves the problem. And AT&T has been you know, um, just grossly negligent in not uh, doing this. Interesting. Um, you know, I, I, I got to do it. Uh, Pavel, if you're on, you get, you get one bite of the apple and, and then we got to wrap because we're over our two hours. Pavel, hi. Hi, now I hear you well, I have Wi-Fi. Okay, real fast. Adam Michael, ask a question or say something awesome. Okay. 
say hi to Michael, ask a question, or say something awesome. Uh, <laughs> hi. Yeah, my Pavel. Uh, I'm a cryptographer. So good to see you all. Yeah, hi, Michael. Hey, Pavel. Uh, I, I follow, follow in your case as well. That's very uh, unique. I mean, it's, it's unique that you've started to actually like do something with that because usually people just, yeah, they're silent. They don't want to brought it to public. So, Someone's got to go after these guys. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you're doing it. Um, and I think the amount of money was worth it and you're not shy. You know, your PR doesn't scare you, you know, because of your background. I think other people might sensitive about perception you're just like a well builder. no i mean the nice thing about owning a pr firm is i know how to get the press for myself and so we've gotten you know i think a billion or something impressions on this i mean we got a wall street journal feature we you know got worldwide coverage in reuters when it first broke mm -hmm. and uh you know we'll see how uh how uh at&t likes the heat of a, of a trial every day when i have a I, I have like you know one of the top litigators in the country um, Pierce O'Donnell from uh, Greenberg Glusker. Um, he has five billion dollars in, uh, in in judgments. Um, uh, has the largest uh, judgment against the U.S. government for a Katrina case. He has the largest government uh, or the judgment largest judgment in the history of California. So you know, I got the right guy on my team, and he will he will tear up AT and T on the stand if they don't settle first. Amazing, and you know, I know what I just said, but we have the. General Counsel of Casper Labs here. Varun, I, I'm going to ask you to unmute if you don't mind. I, I know this is a little ambushy, but I think everyone wants to say hi because all your friends are here. So let's see here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, hey, Varun, good, good to hear you. Maybe you see you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you did ambush me a little bit, but yeah, thank you. Good morning. Nice to, nice to hear all of you. And Tim is smiling from ear to ear right now. You know, it, it, just because I can't imagine. What, what, what time is it, Varun? I mean, you guys are in California. It's super early. Uh, you know, the, vi the video on Varun not right now, I'm not sure if we're going to get a shirtless Varun. Uh, the hair come to, come to the side. What do we get? But uh, it's always good to hear from you, Varun. Thanks, Varun's thanks. super sharp. He's very methodical. Yeah, at 7.30, at 7 we've been at this for two hours. <laughs> yeah. Varun, do you, want, do you want to throw a question to Michael or a comment? Uh, let, let me listen in for a few minutes, uh, get caught up. Well, I, I actually, believe it or not, we're wrapping up. It, it, it's a two-hour show that just went over. Oh, uh, oh, I see. It was two hours, really. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah. no, no, and you know what? The time flies. Um, I'm but, glad we're having fun. Great. I think we're going to expand that next time, and it'll be more guests, less me, more of them. Um, but just everyone should be aware of Varun. He's got, he's got a very methodical, calm approach. He's got a very sharp legal mind. He's open to other ideas, but it's strong in his own points of view. He's a, he's a good lawyer to have on your side, and he's a good lawyer to dialogue with, and he's a good lawyer to. You know, if you're both coming at things from different angles to so talk them through, the composition is pretty methodical. So, Bruno, I, I just want to give you a shout out. And yeah. we, got, we got Mark McCann, we got you, we got, some, we got some good legal minds on this call. You know, I guess I'll, I'll my, we got Wolf. Um, for folks, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. The, it's just for over two hours. <clears throat> I want to deeply thank, deeply thank our two guests. Dean Michael Turpin, um, you really generous with your time with the pre-interview. You're generous with your time now. You obviously got a huge uh, cohort of, you know, collaborators and admirers. You know, they're not people who kind of admire you from far. They you've touched a lot of lives. You know, you've been at this yeah. for a long time. You're not resting on your laurel. Well, thank you. I was going to say I look. I, I haven't had a chance to like even look at all the uh, messages in the chat here. So hopefully uh, you can save that file. <laughs> uh, you know what? I will do my best, actually. That's a fantastic point. I want to end the meeting until I capture that. That's, you know, I'll make a practice change and do that in the future. I, I want to give a heads up to everyone in the audience that next week's show is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be live from Croatia. Okay, live from their split or Dubrovnik. We'll, we'll figure it out. And just like we did a show about Puerto Rico and the crypto scene there, um, we're 90% likely to have some local Croatian blockchain and Bitcoin and crypto talent 
uh, forming a panel. We can talk about that sort of niche jurisdiction. Quite beautiful, you know, the home of Game of Thrones and a lot of other stuff. So I just want to sort of tease that out. Uh, I'm going to pass this back to my co-host, co -host, instigator, all around general awesome guy, Sander. And, uh, yeah, thanks, Gordon. And, and, and talking about teasers, we don't have one, but we have two teasers because next week we have a special edition coming from Croatia and from Amsterdam. We're streaming at the same time. But the oh. week after that, we're tapping into the Asian market. And I've got, uh, uh, Michael and you, Gordon, you're, I think, the only one who already knows. So please keep it as a, as, a, as a small teaser for next week because this guy is not only a personal friend of mine because he's one of the, yeah, how can I say, the big influencers in the Asian market. So I'm looking forward to next week's show all about Croatia. But the week after that, really tap into that. And I would also would like to invite all of the speakers that were here today uh, to be there also and invite their Asian context because this is our way of tapping into the Asian market. So to, to wrap this uh, crypto show, I think we had the jackpot today because we had a very, very special uh, main speaker, which was Michael Turpin. Michael, we are, Gordon and myself, we are both grateful that you were with us, that you spent a lot of time. So thank you for that. If there's anything- we can do for you. We're, we're here for you as industry friends. So thank you, uh, Michael. But I would also like to thank all the previous alumni speakers that were participating. Uh, that was Luke, that was Marco, David, Giovanni, Professor Wolf. Then we have Pedro. We have, uh, we have our Scandinavian friend, Peter. It was good to see you also. Uh, one of our other Asian friends, Malcolm. And we had Timothy uh, and Pablo in the, in the call. So for all of you, thanks for being on the show. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week when we are streaming from Amsterdam and from Croatia. For now, on behalf of Gordon and myself, I would hey, have to Hold on, you know, you, oh. you, you got to do one other person. One other person. Luke. Other Luke. Yeah, because we have two Lukes. You're absolutely right. So we have to thank also Luke, who is our partner from the iconic crypto fund in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. And I work full time together with Luke, and he's been helping us with the crypto show behind the scenes as a moderator. So Luke, also thank you for that, and thank you, Iconic, for being the supplier of this, making this all uh, all available and making it possible. But for now, we're wrapping up. Thanks to all our guests, Michael. Thanks again. We look forward to thank seeing you. you. Have a good day, everybody, and see you okay. next week. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Bye. guys. Bye.